Plas Teg is the most important Jacobean house in Wales. Owner Cornelia Bailey has spent over 20 years single-handedly restoring it. But she's struggling to maintain such a massive building on her own. There's always so much to be done. I mean, I'm a slave to this, this house, utterly. Can businesswoman Ruth Watson help Cornelia preserve this unique national treasure for the future? Cheap. That room is verging on madness. Do you consider yourself eccentric? I don't like meeting people that I don't know. Can you not put the cups oh. on there? In 1986, Place Teg was empty and on the verge of collapse. It had been plundered and left derelict. Cornelia Bailey fell in love with the house and borrowed £70,000 to buy it. It was like a cave. It was full of motorbikes and bits of old cars and things like that. It was just a dump. Cornelia gave up her glamorous life as a Notting Hill antiques dealer and moved to North Wales. Since then, She's devoted her life to Plasteg. She has restored the house and dressed it with antiques, reproduction paintings, and hand-stitched upholstery. But her devotion has come at a cost. Cut off from her old life, she now inhabits the 30,000 square feet of Plasteg alone. In general, I, I don't see many people. Sometimes I go the entire week, it's a real problem. Cornelia opens the house to visitors for just three hours a week on Sunday afternoons and to ghost hunters on occasional nights. I don't meet the people or anything. It's too boring to be asked the same question by every single person. <laughs> so I keep out of the way. I don't like people very much. But the house costs £30,000 a year to run and with so few visitors it makes a massive loss. Self-made businesswoman Ruth Watson has turned around the fortunes of numerous country houses with her straight-talking, no-nonsense approach. On a windy day in spring, Ruth is in North Wales to meet Cornelia in a bid to turn around the fortunes of Plasteg. Hello, this must be the draftiest corner. I think it is. Hello, Ruth. I'm Cornelia. Cornelia. Yes, hi. Yes. How do you do? And what a staggering house. It is, isn't this it? This is just extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. When did you buy it? I bought it 25 years ago. 25 years. As a years. complete and utter ruin. And just fell in love with I it? Fell in love with it, yes. See, it is. I love these mm. girls around the yeah, door. Yeah, this all had to be shot blast. Oh, my word. I love this floor. They're, they're flagstones that I bought from a demolition place. So what was here before? Earth. It had all been stolen. Everything had been stolen. The doors had gone. So the fireplace? fireplace had been stolen. And also, when I came in here, um, there were holes right up. And you could look right up to the roof. And you could see pigeons all in different parts of the house, in cupboards. It was, it was lovely, all flying around. And there was a stream coming through here and trees growing. It sounds more like a farmyard. It was. And in the kitchen, and they'd taken all the windows out and everything. Good grief. So this really has been a life's work. Oh, absolutely. You've done to it. Yes. So it still is. I need to see more. I need yes. to see more. Most of Plasteg's original features had been stolen over the years. But fortunately, one remains. Well, this is a very handsome staircase, isn't it? When I came here, it was covered with black paint. But the miracle secret, is it was here. It was here. It was, it was, it was, I think because it was covered with black paint. People didn't realise. They didn't realise no. the quality of it. It's a beautiful staircase, yes, isn't it? it is. I yeah. mean, it must be um, listed, one assumes. Oh, it is. It's, it's the best in Wales. Best staircase the in best Wales. The best staircase in Wales. Really. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We've got unrivaled access to the world's leading historians, with hundreds of documentaries featuring everything from Boudicca to the British royal family. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and real royalty fans get 50% off their first three months. 
Just be sure to use code REALROYALTY at checkout. This impressive Renaissance staircase, and indeed the whole house, have only survived due to Cornelia's boundless energy and sheer determination. So how much of this work have you had to do yourself? How much was here and how much of...? Um, nothing. Well, the fireplace was here. Right. N nothing. And that, that, was, that was all. So all was you've that, dressed all the walls with the I've fabric? I've stitched all the fabric together, ironed it and organised hanging it up. And all the upholstery? I do, yeah, I do the upholstery. You live here on your own? Yes. No family? No, no family. I, well, I have a son, but I don't know where he is at all. Well, I'm not cut out to be no. a mother. No. no. It's all right when you choose well, the grown up children. You see. You're very honest. Have you about got children? It? No, but I would have <laughs> liked them. I would have liked them. But would you? And I would have changed their nappies. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yes, I would. <laughs> Estranged from her only child, miles away from her friends, and with no one to take over the running of Plasteg, Cornelia's life work will come to nothing if she doesn't secure its future. In the kitchen, Ruth discovers that Cornelia has a rather naive approach to her finances. So what, what are you cooking? You've got the gas on. What's that That's all about? That's for warmth. For warmth? Yes. When there's no central heating on. It's I leave it on all night as well. Isn't that a jolly expensive and not very effective way to what warm up? No, no, I think it seems all right. Really? Do you think it costs more than having a heater? I'm damn sure it costs really? more. Yes. No, I thought it'd be cheaper. How much per year are you spending on heating? Um, I'm not. Oh no, I think it was seven and a half thousand for the heating last last year before the increase. Right. So it must be up to about ten thousand, I think now. How do you afford to spend ten thousand per hunter? Um, an old boyfriend pays for my heating because he doesn't want me to be cold. Well, I think he's the kindest man he's, in the he's world. He's incredibly but... kind. So what else does he pay for? All the bills. He pays all, all your bills? The, all my bills, because I, I don't have any money. You must have attractions that I, I'm not getting. <laughs> Pheromones or something. <laughs> what on earth? That is ex It's energy level. <laughs> That's what it's about. So how long ago was it that you had a relationship um, with the ex? It must be... How many years? So not last 20 year? 20 years. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. <laughs> That's incredible um, and very sweet. Cornelia is fully aware that this kindly patronage may not last forever. How much money do you actually make out of showing people around the house? Um, it can vary between one or two hundred on a Sunday. Per week or? Per week. Yeah. So over the course of the only year? One so that's 5,000 it would be, if it was, wouldn't it be? Yeah, if, yeah. if you have one every week, do you yes. have, yes? Yes, so but obviously if there's snow or sort of bad conditions. So do you think you do come. make £5,000 a year? I don't know, not sure. The money just goes, you know, all the time. You know you haven't got enough money here and yes. you know you need more. Yeah. Does that keep you awake at night? Do you feel fearful about the future? Um, I, I don't think about it. I try not to anyway. I'm just too busy getting on with what I'm doing. With little income and an ever-increasing workload, Cornelia's days at Plasteg are a world away from her previous glamorous life in London. So this is like a gilded cage in some respects? I suppose it is, really, yeah. Hmm. But my thoughts, you know, of, of, of going back 20-something years ago, hmm. Hmm. when life was wonderful and fantastic. And, and you don't think it's wonderful and fantastic now? No. What is it now? Hardship? Just, not just work. But then that's... The world's changed. Mm. Alone with her memories, Cornelia is trapped by the burden of Plasteg. To break free from her isolation, she needs help. Physical and financial. The house has, 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 has got to make money. I can't always be relying on, on you know, one person to help me financially forever. In, ca in case his situation c should change, which it could, you know. I mean, one never knows in life. Or if he suddenly dropped dead, that would be the end of everything. Plas Teg is a Grade One listed house built in the Jacobean style. 
It was one of the most fashionable buildings of its day, with characteristic Dutch gables and elaborate scroll work. The towers in each corner are topped with cupolas and finials. Plasteg was built in 1610 by wealthy politician Sir John Trevor. Its two great chambers, stretching the whole length of the house, were designed to impress his guests. It's said to be the best example of Jacobean architecture in the whole of Wales. But the house has had a troubled history. One owner died in his bed after a riding accident. And it was looted by roundhead soldiers during the Civil War. For many years, the house was used as a lunatic asylum. Today, Plasteg is popular with ghost hunters. Judge Jeffries is said to have hanged criminals in one of the upstairs rooms and some visitors claim to have seen the ghosts of his victims. Owner Cornelia Bailey runs Plasteg on her own. She only opens the house to the public for three hours a week and it's making a huge loss every year. Businesswoman Ruth Watson has come to Plasteg to find new sources of income and save this historic gem for the nation. Ruth sets off with Cornelia to explore the house and its grounds. Hello, boys. But isn't quite prepared for what she's about to discover. Yeah. This is my family. <laughs> I have to ask you, do you consider yourself eccentric? No, no. <laughs> I've always had the boys. They used to live in London with me. How much do these cost to feed? They cost a fortune. Absolute what kind fortune. Of a fortune. Well, their nuts are so expensive. So what do they have? What's their they, diet? They have nuts, walnuts. Mm. Peanuts, bread, mm. biscuits, grapes, pomegranates, and tangerines. They don't like apples. So how much do you think a week? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's better not to know these things. Does I, the I never... eggs pay for the parrots as well? Yes, yes. They're part of the family, so they'll be here for as long as I'm here. That I believe. <laughs> Upstairs, Cornelia shows Ruth one of Plasteg's 12 bedrooms. So this is the panelled bedroom. Yes. For obvious reasons. There is a lot of panelling yes. here. But what's the toucan doing oh, over here? That is Martin Scar. He was the bank manager who lent me the money to buy him. He's called Martin Scar. Scar. Yes. The toucan. The toucan. The bank manager was called Martin Scar as well. Because well, I liked him. And you uh, liked the toucan? Yes. OK, so... And he, li he liked the toucan as well. Oh, right. I was going to say, cos you could... They used to jump up and down with excitement, Mr Toucan dude. When he was alive, When the he bird. was alive, yes. Did you know him when he was alive? Oh, yes. Yes, he had a great big cage. Oh, so stairs. that bird was the alive? Stuff. He's been and you, you stuffed him. But, but now Martin Scar, the bank manager's died as well. But he's not stuffed him. <laughs> Thanks to the help of her supportive bank manager, Cornelia raised enough money to buy the estate and save it from ruin. She's worked tirelessly for 25 years to transform the mansion. But on closer inspection, Ruth discovers that, like a stage set, the house is not as grand as it might first appear. Now, this house has got plenty of bathrooms, and normally I might suggest accommodation as being one of the solutions. But not in this instance, because half of them aren't plumbed in. In this particular case, where there should be pipe work, there's actually a record collection. Over the years, Cornelia has concentrated on accumulating an eclectic mix of artefacts, rather than focusing on practicalities. Ooh, nothing like a room full of naked men. And her obsessive collecting is beginning to create problems of its own. I have never, ever in my life seen anything quite like this. This is where eccentricity slightly slips into madness. What is this all about? And I can see a doorway through there and I have a horrible feeling it might be filled with clothes. Cornelia's passion for collecting has made Plasteg what it is today. But out of the chaos, Ruth needs to find a way for the estate to run as a profitable business. 
She wonders if the key might lie with the handful of volunteers who helped Cornelia out. Jill, you are one of the guides on mm -hmm. the Sunday tours. Yes. And, and how many are you? We've got four of us, I would say, at the moment. How, how many tours do you expect to do every Sunday? About two or three. And so, how many people are you talking about? This time of year, on average, between 15 and 20 people at all. And do you think there should be more people coming round? Yes. And on more days? Mm, well, it's, it's just getting volunteers to come and... I mean, we're all volunteers. Yeah. You should have a job to get volunteers in, I think, any more often than once mm. a week. Do, do you get paid? No, no. It's volunteer. You just do it for love? Yes. And, Paul, what about you and the paranormal tours? How, 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 they're, they're actually overnight stays, aren't they? Till about three in the morning. We don't actually stay overnight. It's very rare. Right. Um, but we, we bring the people in, the public. So how much do the customers pay per head? It's £40 per person. And, and Jill, what do you charge on the daytime visits on Sundays? Uh, £7 for adults and £3.50 for children. That's for an hour and a half and tour. Do people, that's a, a price people are happy to accept? Very. I mean, it's a lot cheaper than a National Trust house. Yeah. Um, I think it, they, they, majority of people say they've, they feel like they've had the money's worth. Right. The real question is that mm. although you're kind enough to do this, um, if you weren't kind enough to do this, then she would be up the swanee, wouldn't she, in terms of any income coming in? Relying on locals for help, Cornelia needs to attract more volunteer supporters. How is she perceived in the area? I mean, is she seen as an eccentric or... I mean, what, what's the general perception? I think people that have actually been to Plasteg and have met her genuinely like her. If you hear anything negative about Cornelia, it's usually from people that don't know her mm -hmm. or haven't been round the house. With more help and more tours, Cornelia could double her income. With this in mind, Ruth sets off to visit a country house nearby that has won awards for its community restoration project. Nant Cluidy Dre is the oldest timbered townhouse in Wales and, like Plasteg, it was rescued from dereliction. Its success is down to the group of friends who support it, coordinated by Samantha Williams. The local people that were involved in the project very early on, so they saw it in this bad state of repair mm. and wanted something to happen to the building. They've come along on the journey with us really and they've really embraced the house so once it was open to the public they've put on special events. As a help. formal structure with the sort of yes. chairman, treasurer, secretary, all Absolutely. that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and how many people are involved in that? There are about 90 people at the moment and growing. Right, yeah. And so do you think it would survive without the friends? I think it would be very difficult. It certainly brought the house to life um, and they get involved with all the visitors that come and the school groups that come along. So they've really brought the house to life and yeah. it's a great experience for people. Fantastic. So they really are true friends of the house. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. A formal Friends of Plasteg organisation could take over much of the work that pensioner Cornelia is struggling with and allow her to open the house more often. As well as providing a support network, Ruth is keen to capitalise on Plasteg's theatrical atmosphere. She's come to Manchester to talk to Susan Williams, a film liaison officer for the North West. We have this wonderful house called Plasteg, which is about an hour from Manchester in North East Wales. And it seems to me a perfect location for film shoots and also still shoots as well. So can you tell me what it is that people are looking for when they're choosing a good location? Um, well, they're looking for the uniqueness of the building. But in terms of just, like, logistics, A, it's got to be easy to get to, because you have to remember they've got a crew that's got to get there. Also, the building itself in terms of who owns it, how accommodating they are to filming. Do you think that actually the fact this is in private hands rather than owned by an authority or, or you know, English Heritage National Trust or one of those bodies, is that actually a plus for Oh, it? that's a definite plus. That's a huge plus. 
it's use it to a location manager's ear when they say, well, no, I own it outright. You yeah. can, you know, we just talk about which yeah. area you want to film yeah. and what you want to do. So easier. that's a definite bonus. Yeah. What kind of location fee would you be Well, it depends how many rooms they're going to use. Right. For any kind of um, inquiry, whether it be a, a photo shoot or a TV drama, you can be earning anything from, like, £100 up to the, to the thousands. Back at Plasteg, and armed with her research, Ruth presents her findings to Cornelia. Hello, Cornelia. Hello, Ruth. How are you? Fine. Good. First of all, I'd just like to say what a marvellous job you've done here. I don't think it's going too far to say that you saved Plasteg for the nation, and I think everyone should be very grateful to you. Oh, uh, good. I'm glad you like Full marks for all that. Oh, good. <laughs> but I don't think you would be able to organise your way out of this <laughs> glass, <laughs> no, you should you fall into that, it. Yes. Now, what you actually have is an amazing circle of supportive friends. Yes. What it is, it's like everything else about this house. It's very unstructured. Yes. People do it out of love for you, love for the house, yes. affection for everything this stands for. And it's marvellous that they do. I mean, you know, it's a credit to you yes. that they do these things. But... What I would like to do is to suggest that this becomes more formalised. What I'm suggesting is that we have a meeting of as many friends that exist at the moment to see who, if at all, would yes. like to take on more structured role. But Cornelia is worried about bringing strangers into the house, having had bad experiences in the past. The problem is some people come here to help, only to steal, and it's happened so many times. Mm. You don't want friends like that. No. They're, they're called enemies. They are. With a more formal organisation, new friends could be hand-picked and provide Cornelia with the assistance she needs to bring in fresh sources of income. The first idea I have for actually trying to produce revenue is that you use this for locations, both for feature film, television film and for still shoots. The house itself is so... Fabulous, so exotic. I mean, it's theatrical, it's full of artifice. It's like some wonderful stage set and it has huge personality and character. And you could get somewhere between 400 and 2,000 a day, completely depending, of course, on what was happening, whether it was yes. a commercial activity, whether it was a, just a short ad, whether it was, you know, a big feature film, whatever. But it could become a really good source of income for you. Now, what, what do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, brilliant idea. Mm. The ideal. In the main, they will organise it all, and all you have to do is fling open the doors of plastic and say, you're welcome. Next, Ruth turns her attention to a solution that will see funds coming into the house immediately. I would like you to consider selling some of the clothes, les vêtements, well, which are it's in diff that It's room. difficult to... It's going to take such a long time to sort them out. I think that room is verging on madness, if yeah. I may say. Have you been right through into the bathroom? I, I, knew, there <laughs> I knew there would be more, more in there. I knew there would be more in there. Even more. I penetrated... Rows and rows of fur capes and all kinds of things, fox fur coats. And... I penetrated to the middle of the room yeah. yes. and realised that there was a doorway which I couldn't yes. actually even yes. get to. Yes. But as I say, it, I think it could raise quite a bit of money. Yeah. Finally, Ruth is convinced that Cornelia could easily reduce her running costs. I know that your whole life is not about administrative stuff. It's not about being practical. It's about fantasy. I do understand yes, that. I know you and do. I'm not trying to <laughs> yes. change it. No, but, I know you know. But there are just a few things that really, really would help on the expenses of yes. this house. And turning off the gas rings is one of them. I mean, just even things like the nuts you buy for the parrots. I mean, I'd like to know how much you spend on that. They're so expensive now. I, know. I mean, the last site was £100, yes. so now they're having to have half walnuts. Yeah. And they've got to have their walnuts because they like them. Got to have their yes, walnuts. it's their favourite. It's like, I've got to have champagne, they've yeah. got to have their walnuts. Yeah, <laughs> yes. OK. <laughs> I think that went fairly well, but there are going to be a lot of stumbling blocks. Cornelia is incredibly unworldly, and she's also implacable about certain things. This house needs friends. She's had them all the way along, and now it needs to be formalised. 
If that can happen, I think Plasteg could ring with the sound of people enjoying it and, more importantly, money could come in. It's two months since Ruth's last visit and changes are already afoot at Plasteg. Janet, one of the original volunteers, has gathered together 15 locals to set up the Friends of Plasteg organisation. Cornelia is too busy to join them. So first and foremost we need um, a chairperson. I won't say a chairman, I'll say a chairperson. Is anybody happy to take on that role? Deadly silence. I was using you perfect. Well, all right then, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. But um, we also need a secretary, which I was prepared to take on, but perhaps Jill can do that instead. <laughs> I thought we were going to share we'll, that. We'll share it. We'll share it. It's a horrible job being a secretary, so we could share that task. The meeting's almost over before Cornelia joins in. Now, Cornelia's the best one to ask where she most needs the help. <laughs> There's endless things all the time. In effect, if you need something doing, you need a list of people that you can call upon to do those particular jobs. Yes, So we yes, need every yes. everybody's expertise, really. Yeah. Someone that is very good with plumbing, someone who is, is very good with joinery, perhaps. Yes. Um, how do you suggest we go about getting more tour guides? We can't <laughs> ask people because we end no. up getting thieves. It really has to be friends of, of people that are already here. Right. Really. Plasteg in North Wales is in financial trouble. 25 years ago, Cornelia Bailey gave up her glamorous life in London to live here alone and rescue the house from dereliction. But with little money coming in, its future is uncertain. We've got to find a solution to keep this house going when, when I'm dead as well as now, but I mean, you know, so it can last forever. Ruth Watson has been drafted in to save the house from peril. She's come up with an idea that has the potential to raise much needed funds and bring some life back to the house. Cornelia has been collecting period costumes for as long as she can remember, and Ruth has invited a team of experts to catalog the impressive collection with a view to selling it off. Claire Nichols runs Vintage Academe, a London-based upmarket fashion emporium. Hello. She's brought along fashion historian Judith Watts and her creative director, Rob Myers. We're going to the clothes room. This is the main room. Oh, how brilliant. There's two rooms like this now. <laughs> Crawl under here. I used to like dressing up in London because yes. they're always like, going to things and things happening. Oh, I've forgotten weird. some of the things I've got some. now because Ooh. there's so many. Mm. I'm going to leave you to go through and sort things out. OK, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> OK. Brilliant fashion books. <laughs> People love these. She is a real collector, She's and I an completely absolutely uh, obsessive. Yeah, and that's she's it. Completely passionate about it. I mean, it's it is order, but it is there is more chaos than I expected. Yeah, yeah. And there is an awful lot more than I expected. Amidst the disorder, there are some exciting finds. Look, this is this really, really lovely little bodice I found. Oh. It's absolutely gorgeous. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's about quite, 1905. Yeah. This. That 1905, 1906. Well yeah, well over 100 years old. Irving Sellers! <laughs> it's really good. Unless it's got an interesting label. That's English. Yeah, that's real thinking. English Carnaby Street. That, that is the 70s. It's fantastic. Mm. So that's about uh, 160, nearly 170 years old. This is beautiful, beautiful silk. We go from uh, the 1840s uh, right up to the 1970s and 1980s. And there are still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of clothes that are next door. The team has unearthed a wealth of vintage attire that will be sent for sale at Bonham's auction house, raising much needed cash for Plasteg. And what's more, Cornelia has enjoyed having people in the house again. Yeah, it's been great, it really has. Yeah. 
Plas Teg is said to be the most important Jacobean mansion in Wales, and Ruth wants to capitalise on this to raise cash. She's arranged for Cornelia to host a fashion photo shoot for the Observer magazine. As a trial, the client gets the house for free today, but a shoot like this could pay over £1,000. So it's vital that Cornelia makes it a success. But the day doesn't get off to a good start. Hello, don't let the cats in. Only the black one with the green collar. So we were going to show you what, what oh, we're doing. Oh, wow. They're amazing, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Can you not put the cups oh, on there? Because it's yeah. a really valuable no. table. Yeah. As the shoot gets underway, Ruth is on her way back to Wales to see how Cornelia's getting on. It's over three months since my last visit to Plasteg and I was hugely impressed by Cornelia's energy and I have to say her eccentricity as well, so I'm going to be interested to see what she's been up to. For 25 years, Cornelia has lived a reclusive life at Plasteg, but she's warming to the company of the fashion crew. Hey, Cornelia, yeah. how are you? Are you well? Yeah, absolutely. Hello, yeah. yeah. how are you? Nice to meet you. Yeah. Can you see around the... That's beautiful. <gasps> that is stunning. <laughs> oh, wonderful. That is so Isn't it marvellous. amazing? Isn't, Isn't it? it? Come and tell me what's been going on. Absolutely. Can catch up. Yeah, lovely to meet you, Joe. Yeah, thank okay. you. I'm really enjoying it. It's yeah. wonderful. I mean, it's like living in London all over again. Is it? <laughs> yes. So London's come to you. you? Yeah, I know. I wish you could all stay up and live up here. It would be so much nicer. Really? Because yes. it's actually bringing energy and, and life absolutely. And, and fashion. Yes. And fashion, and all the things. Yeah. 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 So you're really absolutely. liking it. And the model, she's wonderful. She's, you know, she really moves well. The colouring's fantastic. You know, it's, it's, it's so pretty. It's like fairyland, you know, it's really good. The shoot has brought some glamour back to Plasteg, and Joe Jones, the Observer's fashion editor, is impressed by what she's seen. It's amazing. It's just having somewhere with a little bit of character, and with these big houses, the light is always amazing in the yeah. windows. Yeah. Well, I've always thought this is a bit like a stage set anyway, because Cornelia being such a great collector, and everything is not quite as it should be. If you actually poke around, yeah. you know, the upholstery isn't really finely finished and the paintings aren't genuine and it seems to be like one great set. The house might provide a fanciful backdrop but Ruth is concerned that important details are being overlooked. How has it been for you as people though because I appreciate it's really good for you doing your job. So the loose for example. Yes. I think you, you could do with, I don't know what their names are, the two ladies that come in and clean houses would be horrified at the loose. <laughs> and, um, and the kitchen facilities, I mean, you've brought your own kettle, but... Yeah, we're find... avoiding the kitchen area. There's a supermarket down the road and, yeah, we're catering in with our staff. Mm -hmm. And um, we've seen a few little creatures crawling around and... Um... Four-legged. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. And uh, we've seen, nice. like, yes. But <clears throat> so far, so good. Yeah, so far so good. I mean, I think, like you say, if, if she could sort out the toilets and have a kitchen area mm. and just so it's a little bit more comfortable to work. Mm. Mm. Um, so yes. look after the principles a bit better because yeah. the house itself is good enough for you exactly, to... Exactly, yeah. exactly. Cornelia cleans the house herself and Ruth thinks that concerns about the facilities can be easily addressed. Specifically, bar of soap. Yes, that doesn't look very nice, does it? No, and I mean, you know, there's it's this, it's stuff like yes. this. I mean, this is just dust, you know. I can't understand how it's got so dusty. Well, I can't. It hasn't been cleaned. <laughs> That's yeah. how it's got so dusty. I mean, it's okay having old things. Yes. But in a bathroom and a kitchen, they've got to be clean old things. Yes. You know? Yeah. And the base and stated thing, and this towel is just vile. I mean, I hate deep dyed towels anyway yes. because they hide everything or they're meant to hide everything. But it just isn't attractive no, right. and you know it's hanging on a thing with full of dust yeah you know so yes. I think this needs a really really good scour yes. yeah and then done on a regular weekly basis yes. if not yes more so yeah do you get my yeah, meaning? yeah absolutely yeah. the new friends of Plasteg could take on some of the work Cornelia is struggling with and Ruth thinks she knows why some of the detail is being overlooked I'm going to ask you a very personal question here Cornelia yeah 
How is your eyesight? Terrible. But I put my glasses on to do things. Because I'm wondering whether that's the problem that I know being very short-sighted myself, yes. that when I'm not wearing my contact lenses, everything looks rather beautiful because yes. there's this lovely sort of blur. Mm. And the trouble with cleaning loos and hand basins and, and, and the floor and all those things is you really need to be able to see. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then when you start bending down, your glasses fall off. Well, that may be the problem because it really does look very grimy in there. You see, there's the only me to do everything. I mean, look at the state I'm in with, with all the work I do. Those nails are the nails of a woman who works in the garden. Yeah. And those hands it's are the all hands of a woman who works anywhere and everywhere. Good luck to you and full marks <laughs> for the fact that you do work. I mean, yeah. I'm really, I, you know, I'm really appreciative mm. of that. And I think it's a great thing that you don't just lounge around reading no, grants no, here and things. No, no it's great. Mm. But I think you do have to actually make this differentiation between how you live and yes. how the people who are paying you money yes. are prepared yes. to live. Yes. Yes. Do you see what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Tell me about the money you're still spending on this gas ring. You can't do it. Turn it off. How does it that turn way. off? That way. It's off. It's off. That's <laughs> yes. it. I never want to see that on again. Unless <laughs> you're boiling a kettle. To help relieve Cornelia's burden, Ruth has instigated a formal Friends of Plasteg organisation. But to be effective, the group needs more members. They've organised their first event at the house, a reception for 50 influential locals, politicians and civic leaders to attract new volunteers and raise the estate's profile. But on the morning of the party, a reluctant Cornelia is still unwilling to accept their help. But the friends won't do anything. There's nothing for them to do. The glasses look as if they need a bit of a polish. I have yeah. checked no, them. Done uh, they, they do That's need wrong. a polish. Yeah, they need a bit of a polish. I've, I've, I've had a look. I've so we've just got to decide then it's too where. Early to do the things yeah, now. Yeah, it's um, we've got this... to decide where it's I going to. Know, you know, I might put a clean tablecloth on the table if I can find one. Do you always go and uh, check the toilets, clean I've, the toilets? I've done them. Oh, you have. I mean, they're as clean as they will be. Oh, I'll go and have a look anyway. You know, I mean, I've, I've done what I, all I can do in there, yeah. these things, but they don't come any cleaner. Okay, shall we get going? I think we've got a lot to do. Well, right. Come on, let's hit the road. The reception is a perfect opportunity for Plasteg to reach a wider circle of supporters. Without Cornelia's cooperation, it could be a disaster. Ruth Watson's on her way back to North Wales for the final time. This is my last visit to Plasteg and it's the day of the friends party and it's going to be so interesting to see whether Cornelia's really up for this. She's been quite disparaging about the idea of having friends. I think she feels she needs to like them. What she actually needs is support and people to help her. So, Cornelia, are you braced? On arrival, Ruth finds Cornelia unhappy about welcoming a large number of strangers into the house. Not really looking forward to it. Really? No. Is that just because there's such a lot the, the, of organisation? Yeah, there? absolutely. Yes, yes. And, yeah. and a whole lot of people. I don't like meeting people that I don't know. Yes. That I think I probably won't like. I want you to be as composed and as happy as you can be. I won't be. I want you to <laughs> be. I'm going to wave my magic wand. Impossible. You will be. We should have had the party <laughs> just for us. It would have been so much nicer. No, I, you agree? I want you to relax because if we get all the preparations sorted before people come, so you're not worried about things going wrong, you know, yeah. either people stealing things or whatever, then you can relax. Yes. Yeah? But, but I've, I've, I will be worried. Well, don't I be can't, worried. I can't. I mean... Don't be worried because we'll take care of it. And now, what about clothes? Because I'd like to think that you're not getting dressed up. Couldn't we just have another top on? Maybe another top. Um, We've got to get people to go at seven o'clock. Yes, all right. Otherwise, they, you know, because yeah. they'd be so boring, most of them. That... Well, you don't know. Oh. And don't forget, you don't have to talk to all of them. No, I'm not going to. <laughs> Everybody gets stressed out before a big party, but Cornelia seems so wound up about it. I just hope that as the day progresses and people arrive that she'll actually begin to derive some enjoyment about having friends here at Plasteg. As the volunteers prepare for the reception, Cornelia finds it all too much. 
We're just talking about food for your party. <laughs> and with an hour to go, she retires to her bedroom, leaving the friends to worry about the party. My concern is she's not going to be showing people round upstairs. Well, I think we have to, because it's not going to work mm. if people can't see what's on offer. So I, I think I, I think some think some emollient excellent. throughout the day mm. will help. Yes. <laughs> the people yes. that are coming today will advertise the place. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. No. They're not going no. to advertise she's, she's one feeling, room. She's feeling very stressed out and quite hostile to it, but we have to get her to see well, that it's an important that. thing. You know, for people from the heritage department, yeah, the planning department, they can be so useful yeah. to Plaster. Absolutely. What's that? What is it? Disgusting. In the absence of the host, Ruth and the friends get to work. Let's go round. But there's one detail Ruth wants to check for herself. Oh, thank God it's been done. New towels, clean soap, and yes, the basins are old and chipped, that doesn't matter. At least they're not covered in grime and dirt. Well done, Cornelia. Very good. The new Friends of Plasteg have organised a launch party to attract vital new supporters to the house. They've managed to attract two members of parliament, David Hansen and Mark Tammy, the local mayor and dozens of influential locals. Armed with champagne, the Friends seize the chance to promote the house and the guests are suitably impressed. This is actually my first visit inside. I've known about the building, I've known about the restoration, but it's great to come in and actually see what's going on. And it's a really magnificent building, and the work that's gone on to restore it has been absolutely, uh, truly magnificent. Cornelia is still noticeable by her absence, but the friends are busy recruiting. So we book up with you, do we? Yes, or through Cornelia, and, wherever. And you can go on the website as well. I found the tour so interesting and intriguing and I wanted to know more. Yeah. And they were asking for volunteers, so I immediately leapt at the chance. Cornelia eventually makes a discreet entrance and, unusually, is soon basking in the limelight. And the observer came here, it was one of the best houses they've ever been to. They loved it so much. This is what it's all about, getting a group of people in who will hopefully be friends of Plastig and therefore friends of Cornelia. Despite all her misgivings, she really does seem to be enjoying it. Me Kieran too, does too. tours and helps on the Sunday. Very good. I'm going to be doing the rope to make sure that, that I'm not four of us one week and one person the next week, yeah. so I'll be sorting all that out. And then we could have weddings and we could have car boot sales, yes. we could have circuses, all kinds yeah. of things. Before long, Cornelia's enjoying the party enough to start recruiting herself. You've got to friends of past I believe. Well, we've got a few. We haven't got enough people. Well, you don't advertise well enough. Well, I'll join. Would you? Yes. 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 Before yes. anybody goes out the door, you've got to make sure that they join. Yes. <laughs> It's good to just feel that the house is actually full of life and laughter. Yes, think? yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, definitely. But I still it would have been better with just us lot. <laughs> Excuse me, everyone. Can I have your attention? Hello. 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 Thank you very much indeed for coming along to Plastic. Um, I'd like to say thank you on behalf, of course, of Cornelia. I would like to ask David Hansen, who's one of your local MPs, to come and say a few words. Uh, well, well, and can I thank on behalf of all the guests here today to Cornelia for allowing us to join you on what is a very special day to celebrate Plasteg and all that you've done for Plasteg over the past 23 years. This is a magnificent house that has a magnificent history and that will tell future generations about how people lived in Jacobean times and also how you've lived today to make this place what it is. So I want to say thank you to you on behalf of uh, all your guests for that right. effort. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, Funny, Camilla, I know this is absolutely not your thing. Could you bring yourself to say a few words to no. the assembled company? <laughs> 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 Somehow I knew that would be the answer. <laughs> 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 Away from the guests, Cornelia does say a few words. 
So Cornelia, how do you think all this has been? Have you enjoyed having people in the house, the model girls, the photo shoot, the party? Has it been good? It's been fabulous. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. It's been wonderful. I'm I mean, really normally my life is so boring. Yeah. All I do is work. Yes. Whereas I work, but I mean, it was nice seeing yeah. other people's yeah. lives and things, other people creating and doing things, yeah. which is good, which, yeah. I like, which is what I like. Well, I think you've got a lot of people now who are really going to help, and it's going to take some time. Yeah. But I do think that we've got the bedrock now, the first stirrings of a properly structured group of people who yes. will help you here. Can you see that things might be better in the future? I hope so. Yeah. Yes, I think they could be. I want you to come and live here, Ruth. That's the answer. <laughs> I can't imagine it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time this afternoon when I thought Cornelia might not even show up for this party, but it seems to be a huge success, and you can tell she's really enjoying herself. This is a woman who's marvellous, she's mercurial, she's maverick, and I really hope that every good thing comes to her and, of course, to Plasteg. River Hill House in Kent, a Queen Anne Manor built in 1714. The Rogers family have lived here since 1840. To make ends meet, they open the historic gardens to the public, but visitor numbers are dwindling. Over 60 years, Evelyn Rogers has seen the once magnificent treasured estate fall into disrepair. It has gone through very hard times, this poor old place, really. It's gone down, down, down. Grandson Ed and his wife Sarah are desperate to save River Hill for the next generation. I've begun to feel more overwhelmed by the place. The income coming in isn't getting any greater, so, you know, something's got to give somewhere. Can businesswoman Ruth Watson secure River Hill's future and persuade the generations of this distinguished family to agree on the way forward? You said to me that you were proud of the fact that you kept your mouth closed. Mm. I would never say don't do it, it's up to him. She can be a little stubborn on certain points. I just wouldn't like it. River Hill House near Seven Oaks in Kent is a Grade II listed manor built from local ragstone. Nestled into the hillside in 130 acres of splendid grounds, the listed gardens are of great historic importance, bearing rare trees and plants. For over 160 years, River Hill has been home to the Rogers family. The current custodians are Ed Rogers and his wife, Sarah, a former teacher. I live here with what I call my three Mrs. Rogers, which is my grandmother, my mother, and Sarah. They're my sort of force on the ground. Four generations of the family live at River Hill. Ed and Sarah live with their children in a cottage on the grounds. Ed's mum, Jane, lives in the main house, and Ed's grandmother, Evelyn, resides in the lodge. She's lived at River Hill since the end of World War II, and at 86, remains the matriarch of the family. Obviously, I've come to the time of my life when I should be taking a back seat. But you see, we can't manage without each other. And I think my mother-in-law has given her life to this place. Mm. And, well, I suppose, in the sort of way I have, really. Ed was just 21 when he took on the crumbling estate after his father, Johnny, died prematurely of a brain tumour. That changed the dynamic in that I sort of became more responsible. It came as quite a shock, really, to suddenly find that you were in the driving seat. Just finished university, and then suddenly you're, you're worrying about block drains, leaking roofs. It's a lovely place to live, but it's, it's not easy. Ed works full-time in the city and struggles to run the 130-acre estate. Ed's the first Rogers to earn money for nearly 200 years, and it's terribly important, but he works desperately hard. 
He can't be everywhere at the same moment. The Spring Gardens only open to the public on Sundays and bank holidays for just three months of the year, bringing in £5,000. But it costs £50,000 to keep the estate going. It's a constant worry for Ed, and selling up isn't an option. I'd like to you know, certainly give it my best shot before, before one goes down that route. Can I just interrupt? That sounds so lame. Can you just give a bit of passion of why you like it? Why do you love it? <laughs> why do you really want to be here? You're not going to just give it your best shot, because that <laughs> means it might fail. You've got right, to be okay. a bit of determination. OK. Sarah might be a relative newcomer to the family, but she's ambitious and pragmatic, and realises that if River Hill is to survive, it needs to change. The Rogers are very bright people, um, they're very learned people, but they haven't had to be money makers. So we've already got lots and lots of ideas, but the question is which one to pursue. But Sarah knows that as the latest Mrs Rogers, she needs to tread carefully. I think it might lose something of its flavour of a family home if it got too big. It would be nice to get much bigger, but not that big. In an attempt to turn the fortunes of the family home around, business guru Ruth Watson's been called in to help. Today she's in Kent to meet the Rogers and secure River Hill House and Gardens for the future. We're frightened of embarking on some schemes. Ruth may be able to give us the confidence, the confidence to do them. Hello, I'm Ed. Welcome to River Hill. How do you do? Thank you for the very welcome umbrella. It's awful. Hello, Ruth. This is Sarah. Sarah, Sarah. 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 hello. How do you do? Do come in. Gosh, it's wet. Ruth begins her tour of the house in the Grand Hall. Come on in. Oh, this is marvellous. Look at this ceiling. On a bit of sort of history of the family, um, one of our most famous ancestors was John Rogers the Martyr, who was burnt at the stake at Smithfield in 1555. Yeah. And who uh, lives here? My mother lives here. Your mother lives yes. here, right. Yes. And then where do you live? Just down the track, through just the other side of the farm. And so. you have a grandma, I believe, as well? Yes, my grandmother lives in the lodge. Yeah. So can I see some more of the house? Yes, absolutely. Come through to the drawing room. Since Ed took over the house in 1995, little has changed at River Hill. So this is the drawing room. That's drawing. right. Yeah. Yep. The drawing room. Yeah. There's a picture over there of what the house looked like when my family bought it. For a house in such a prime hillside location, the outlook today is very different. Can I just say that the first thing that hits me is there is no view, and yet there should be a view. I mean, what is this awful stuff outside the window? Well, the yew hedge was allowed to grow up to... I mean, Block the road down I there. think it's very oppressive looking. I mean, one doesn't look at the garden and think how beautiful at the moment. No. In its heyday, River Hill House would have been a bustling family home with 12 live-in servants, a dairy maid and eight full-time gardeners. Today, Ed's mother Jane lives in it alone. And it's a very different story. How much does it matter to you that the house stays in the Rogers family? So, River Hill is very important to me. I don't want to be the generation that sort of gives up on it. Do you come from a similar family? Not at all, no, no. definitely not. So and um, my father's a doctor and he's lived in so many different houses. Yeah. When I first met Ed, it seemed quite strange, the idea that you would stay in the same house. Mm. I've come to realise how lovely it is to have that thought that our children are part of this mm. long line of... Of Rogers. <laughs> the hairstyle is even um, traditional now. Is it? And unchanged. It's genetic. It's not Gen genetic. <laughs> <laughs> it looks very 20s, I have to say. Very yeah. sort of 20s, 30s. Kind of. Timeless is what I... It's timeless. <laughs> timeless. OK, all right, OK. Family values are undoubtedly important to the Rogers, but Ruth wants to find out more. Having met one Mrs Rogers, she's keen to meet the other two. This is my mother, Jane. Hello, Hello how do you nice do? to meet you. And my grandmother. You. Hello. Hello, Hello Mrs. Rogers. Yes. Yes. Hello. Do sit down. Thank you. What sort of income is derived from the gardens at the moment? Practically nothing. The, the garden <laughs> barely at the moment makes enough to cover the cost of actually doing it. Do you just make the decisions, Ed? Or are no decisions made? No decisions really <laughs> made at the moment, are they? We usually put sort of one foot forward and about 20 back. Do you have any income, Jane, that you either contribute or are you a tenant here? Do you pay rent? How does it work? 
I'm just a sort of housekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid right. I just don't have the money to put into no. it. Right. But I do try and look after it. As I suppose mm. really it's been a challenge ever since, you know, I've lived here mm. and with Johnny dying and for, for Ed to carry on. Ed's father, Johnny, was just 51 when he died 15 years ago. But it's not the only tragedy to have hit the family. My uncle, my father's brother, who, who sadly died about five years ago, he um, was a bachelor and w was very fond of the family home. Mm -hmm. um, and he very kindly has left some money for the maintenance of the garden, not the house, right. but the maintenance of the garden. With some capital set aside for the gardens, they could be utilised to secure the future of the whole estate. The question is, how? I've got lots of ideas, but I'm not very brave, Ruth. Right. Give me a couple of ideas that you've had. Well, I've had an idea of putting a wind farm up mm -hmm. at the top of the hill. Mm -hmm. We've got some wonderful woodland, mm. and I thought of perhaps having some sort of adventure trails mm. for children. But, not but with there. space for just 30 cars on site, Evelyn thinks that the family should concentrate on practicalities first. One of our troubles is our parking is yes. not brilliant here. Yeah. We're frightened that if we have more than 30 cars, we can't park mm. them, so we think, oh, well, don't bother doing it. The family have been here since 1840, and during this whole period of time, all they've had to do was sit around, have a lovely time, collect plants and have their portraits painted. The problem now is it's the 21st century. Whatever happens here is going to be something of a culture shock. If River Hill House and its splendid gardens are to survive, radical changes need to be made. But will Ruth be able to spur the Rogers into action? It took Ed over 10 years to propose to me, so it wouldn't, there's no rushing the Rogers. River Hill House is the ancestral home of the Rogers family, who have lived here for nearly two centuries. But current owners Ed Rogers and his wife Sarah are struggling to keep the crumbling pile and its historic gardens going. My family created everything around me here, so if I give it all up and hand it on to somebody else, I feel I've given away 160 years of history suddenly in one, in one bosh. Overlooking the Weald of Kent, River Hill House is a fine Queen Anne Manor, complete with two grand reception rooms, antique wood panelling and ornate ceilings. Keen botanist John Rogers, a contemporary of Charles Darwin, purchased the estate in 1840 because of its sheltered location and lime-free soil. An early member of the Royal Horticultural Society, he was a patron of the intrepid Victorian plant hunters who brought back rare and beautiful specimens from as far afield as the Himalayas. It's thanks to his foresight that River Hill has such splendid gardens today. But over the decades, the family's fortunes declined. The house and its historic grounds are falling into disrepair. The spring gardens only open for around 20 days a year between March and June, attracting fewer than 1,000 visitors and little income. Ruth Watson's been called in to help turn the estate's fortunes around. So this is this year's disaster, Ruth, I'm afraid. Our walled garden, the frost got into the brickwork and the sort of freeze-thaw action caused it to just collapse. So up beyond the planting here, that's still your land? That's our land, yes. Through there we have... Our woodland garden, which was created by my great-grandfather between the two walls. That's where most of the visitors go, is it? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's where, that the, where, where the colour is. Yeah. yeah. Sarah used to be a primary school teacher and thinks the key to River Hill's success could be creating a more child-friendly environment. Watch your feet, Ruth. Yes. <laughs> Don't worry, this bit's not open to the public. So this is what you refer to as the rockery? That's right. Um, it was created by my great-grandmother. In its heyday, this was absolutely magnificent. It had um, little paths and the water gushing down and sort of a fairy's grotto. Yes, it is. Very I wonder about like. sort of little children's yeah. parties and having maybe Clemmies have a third birthday party. I mean, how much would you grotto. like the garden to be really approachable by children? Oh, very much so, yes. I mean, the, that's the thing. I'm not a really a horticulturist, but I see everything in the eyes of children. I think 
perhaps we want to retain the sort of wildness yeah. and lose you know, lose the areas which are sort of derelict. Yeah, what a job yeah. for you, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pick up this little wild one. Come on, Clem. Go on a <laughs> journey. Little has altered at River Hill since the gardens were established, and Sarah can see that the estate's survival depends on change. Ed's grandmother, Evelyn, is less keen and wants to see the garden's tranquility and historical links maintained. I've put out here a letter from Charles Darwin to the John Rogers of the day. But they were both fellows of the Royal Society. The so John Rogers who bought River Hill was incredibly brainy. And I always say to people, if Darwin was writing to him, as you can see in the letter, asking him a question, referring to him, he must have been pretty brainy for Darwin to, <laughs> to yes. want to ask him something. Yes. What really bothers me about all of this is, does anyone other than you and the family know all this? Not really. <laughs> Because, I mean, this is actually really quite worrying because mm -hmm. if you're the only person who has the knowledge mm -hmm. of all these things... I'm very conscious of the winged chariot is getting nearer all the time, you know, and uh, I would love to have more time to write, mm. but one gets so bogged down with just day-to-day -day living, which is unfortunate, mm. really. At 86, Evelyn remains head of the family. And Ruth wants to ensure that this won't prove an obstacle to any potential plans at River Hill. How much do you think you're still the matriarchal figure here and that, that everyone is going to do what you want them oh, to do? Oh, I don't them? say what I want anymore. So you're very happy for Ed to have free reign, as it were? Well, he must. Mm. Whether I'm happy or not is another thing, but he must. When you hand it over, it's rather like when you first send your child away to school. Mm. Is it going to be looked after with loving care? Is it going to be understood? Mm. Because I do think these houses have got a soul, in a mm. way. When the gardens are open to the public, Ed's mum, Jane, is in charge of catering. So that's your responsibility, opening that door every time. <laughs> it is, because there's no-one else who can open it. And do you have to man this tea room all the time? We don't make enough money, right. you know, to pay someone to come here, really. Yeah. Like Evelyn and Sarah, Jane also married into the Rogers family, and Ruth's keen to find out more about how she fits in. Being in the middle of the generations, with your mother-in-law still having a voice, I mean, does that make you feel that you can't do things? Um, she does actually say what she likes yeah. or doesn't like. Yes, I got um, that impression. You know, but I feel that Ed and Sarah are sort of young enough. They're together. They've got more go, I think. Mm. And you uh, think the house will be all right with Ed as the owner? I hope so. I really hope so. Yeah. Being the newest Mrs. Rogers is something of a challenge for Sarah. How do you feel about being the third Mrs. Rogers? I mean, of the ones I've met, of course. Slightly daunted, I think. Um, yeah. The main thing is not to try and copy, mm. but to try and do one's own thing. Um, you know, it took Ed over ten years to propose to me, so <laughs> it, there's no rushing the Rogers. Yeah. What prompted it in the end? Well, I just stamped my foot a bit, I suppose. <laughs> said, would you propose? I said, you know, it's now or never. <laughs> so Ed likes to be quite sure. I'd rush headlong into yes. a scheme and yeah. get my fingers burnt, but somehow I think perhaps a bit of a mixture of the two I would be... I think you're probably right. I'm hoping yes. we'll be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I hope that that was... Um, with three Mrs. Rogers living on site, Ruth's got her work cut out if she's going to convince them all that change is inevitable. As the Garden of England, Kent is rich in profitable tourist attractions. Today, Ruth's on her way to one such popular destination, Hever Castle, once home to the ill-fated Boleyn family. Like Riverhill, Hever also has stunning spring gardens, yet attracts visitors all year round. Ruth wants to know from the castle's chief executive, Duncan Leslie, how they've become so successful. So what kind of visitor numbers do you get annually? Uh, we had just under a quarter of a million last year. That's a lot. And how much are they paying per head? Uh, £12 for adults, yeah. uh, £6.50 for children. Yes. And uh, if it's just the, the grounds, an adult will be paying about £9. Right. So how do you keep visitor numbers up here? Because this essentially is a spring garden, isn't it? Spring colours are very good, but, yeah. but we produce colour in the summer as well. And we're wanting people to come here as many times as possible, not just come here once. And if they come in the spring, they'll see something very different from having come in the autumn and vice versa in the summer. We constantly evolve. Um, I liaise a lot with the head gardener, as do the owners. You know, they have an interest in the garden. You've got to keep interest going, and I think you know, visitors thoroughly enjoy seeing something new, something different. 
With this in mind, Ruth's next port of call is Leeds Castle. Set in 500 acres of glorious parkland, one popular tourist attraction is the world-famous maze, constructed using 2,400 yew trees. I'm trying to find Adrian Fisher, who's the world's leading maze designer. And he's done too good a job here because I can't find the centre and I've been walking for ages. Adrian! Hello. I can't find you! Oh, you'll have to go back the other way, actually. The other way, right. So, Adrian, you're the creator of this evil maze. You've done a lot of projects. It's about 500 mazes all around the world. Now, if you say a maze is actually a puzzle, can we create a puzzle without it being such a formal maze in a woodland it garden? It could well be, yes. It could, in, the, the whole landscape could be one enormous puzzle. The experience can be actually quite different visit by visit. The maze is clearly a memorable experience for the thousands of tourists who visit Leeds Castle. An attraction such as this could prove a money spinner for River Hill. There are three generations of brochures, in fact four, at River Hill, if you include the tiny tots. Yeah. I think it'd be marvellous if you could come and meet them. Yeah, I'd love to. Having done her research, Ruth's come up with a plan of action for the Rogers. She's back at River Hill to deliver her findings, convinced that the answer lies within the historical grounds. Good morning, Mrs. Rogers, Mrs. Rogers, Mrs. Rogers, and Ed. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is all about the garden. The whole problem with this garden is it has such a short season. It has very few visitors. Your advertising actually speaks more about when you're not open than when you are open. And I think that's all got to be completely changed. The first thing that needs to happen is a car park. I think you should engage the services of two or three car park contractors who understand about how to do this. And I think that project needs to be begun sooner rather than later. Ruth also wants to ensure that River Hill's remarkable history is documented for future generations. One of the most important things, Mrs. Rogers Senior, is the fount of all knowledge here, and you know this. Whether it's the plants, whether it's the history of the family, all these things are incredibly precious, both to you as a family, but also to our heritage. And I think you should set aside perhaps an hour every weekend and just record you speaking about everything you know Yes, I know if I went under a bus, there's so much in my head exactly. that will just go forever. Ruth believes that the historic grounds can increase revenue enough to support the entire estate. But to do so, the Rogers will have to raise their game. I think you need to be thinking much bigger than you are at the moment. At the end of the day, visitor numbers have to be increased. You have to have the car park. You have to have attractions linking from the Darwin, the history of the garden, mm. through the garden itself and the plants. What Ruth wants to see at River Hill is a major children's attraction that will lure visitors and revenue through the gates. She wants the Rogers to research the concept. My trump card is a chap called Adrian Fisher. He is the world's leading designer of mazes. He works absolutely with the owners of the site to create things that are specifically good for here. He can do things that are trails, he can do adventure walks, he can do exploratory things, he can tie in with Darwin. It's all about puzzles and gardens which attract both adults and children. And Ruth thinks the Rogers are missing a trick when it comes to plant regeneration. Where you need to replant, I think you should be setting up an adopt a plant kind of notion. Not the garden side. You can actually get people to sponsor that plant. I think it makes them part and parcel of River Hill. I think it would take away the family atmosphere of the garden. There are various things here planted in memory of members of the family. Yeah. And I think to have complete strangers commemorated in the garden would to me, not be the same thing. I don't know what you feel. Well, you said to me that you were proud of the fact that you kept your mouth closed. Mm. So I think this is a moment where you really have got to search your soul and say, will I willingly let Ed take on full responsibility? 
I couldn't stop saying a thing like I said about other people's memorial plants. But it's up to him. I would never say don't do it. It's up to him. Right. But I just wouldn't like it. OK. It's now time for Ed to step up to the mark and be the man. Now, there's one last thing I would like you to do before I come back. And I think it would be symbolic of change. And that is to cut down the yew hedge. And I think that should be your private little act of commitment to going forward. Yeah. Good. Ruth's findings have given the family plenty to think about. Obviously, it's hurtful to be told it's all in such a sort of state of shambles, which it is. I mean, I know it, I know it is, you see. Sarah being new blood on the block sort of thing has some, you know, perhaps some out-of-the-box ideas. Equally, at the other end of the spectrum, we, you know, we've got my grandmother, who's been here 60 years, and, you know, I think her goal would be that, you know, this remains a family home. I mean it with no disrespect to my grandmother-in-law, um, who is a wealth of knowledge, but she can also... Um, be a little stubborn on certain points. I have no idea what Ed will do, but myself, I'd have reservations on putting too much into it. But I know we've got to put something into it, you know, but I just think it's a little bit frightening. Six weeks after Ruth's visit, and the Rogers are already getting down to business. They've got a team of tree surgeons in to tackle the overgrown yew hedge. And Sarah's wasted no time at all in calling in May's expert, Adrian Fisher, for advice. What I'd really like to do is stand back as far as we can and you show me what excites you. Let's go and explore, Let's I do want that. to show Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> Before Ed and Sarah can decide where to site the maze, there's a wealth of planning to consider. One thing that excites me about this is, this is the sort of place where you could kind of put a magnet in the landscape. Right. And you could draw people through the exciting, intimate gardens one way, yeah. and then encourage them to go back another way. Right, right OK. Thus, they, they can't help it, but because they're coming to some sort of magnet here, yes. yep. yeah. before you know it, they've actually enjoyed an awful lot of the gardens without even realising they've been exploring them. Yeah. Right. Well, this is our... Um, view we've got here from the top of the hill, one of the highest <laughs> points in Kent other than the Downs. It's such a fantastic view, it would be crazy not to include it in the... I think we've got to get people up here. People it's... love coming to the top yeah. of the hills, don't they? It's not just a garden, it's, it's not even a garden lover's garden, it's actually a... It's one of the family homes of national importance in the gardening world. River Hill is on the brink of its biggest transformation in over a century. But Ed's grandmother has her doubts. I fear for them, that's all. I just don't want them to get themselves into a real tank. And Sarah's confidence is challenged by the sheer scale of the undertaking. Well, I was feeling quite optimistic, but <laughs> I'm feeling a little worried about it all now. Ruth Watson is on a mission to rescue River Hill House and its historic gardens from dereliction. In a bid to increase their revenue, Ed and Sarah Rogers are planning the first major commercial operation in the estate's history by launching an ambitious children's woodland experience. Ed's grandmother, Evelyn, is following Ruth's advice and recording the family's history for posterity, with a bit of help from granddaughter-in-law, Sarah. And I thought perhaps we could talk about the trees. Yes. And then perhaps go up into the wood garden. I think so, because I think with these three trees... Well, hold on a minute. Let me just start off the camera a minute. OK. Right, it's far away. Talk about the three yes. trees there, because they are so wonderful, and it was so incredibly lucky with the storm that they survived. Right. But what is interesting from the family point of view is the turkey oak, which is the big spreading right, tree. Right, let me just there. get a shot of that. Hold on. Yep, the turkey oak, yep. Because that came back as an acorn in the pocket of Ed's great-grandfather after he'd been fighting in the Crimea. Ed and Sarah have grand designs for River Hill, and Ed's already started clearing the site. But Evelyn is anxious that with the ambitious new plans, the River Hill she knows and loves isn't spoiled. What a lot of the public say is what they love is that it is a family home and it, it isn't too commercial. And I don't want the atmosphere of the place to go by being absolutely overrun with people. So I think you've just got to be jolly careful to keep the balance of that. 
Aware that Riverhill's survival depends on change, Ed is also mindful of his grandmother's concerns. I think my grandmother has very much felt, you know, this has been her home for, for 60 years or so, um, and the garden and the garden opening has been very much her thing. So I think that that is quite a transition um, for her, you know, changing possibly the scale of it, which is what we ultimately need to do. And I think that that's possibly something that daunts her a little bit. But it's not only Evelyn who's overwhelmed by the speed of change. A bit daunted myself, I have to say. Well, I was feeling quite optimistic, but <laughs> I'm feeling a little worried about it all now. Hi, Simon. Sarah Rogers here. Um... As a former teacher, Sarah's convinced that the future of Riverhill is all about attracting children and their families to the estate. Thanks ever so much for the designs you sent through. So we wondered whether it could be slightly more Himalayan looking. So um, I just wanted to really chat things through with you. The gardens are famous for the rare specimens brought back from Nepal, China, and the Himalayas in the 1800s. And Sarah's keen to embrace this. I did this map and I put on these, I did these sort of symbols like this. And Ed pointed out that you can't have that because that means fir trees. And he's very pedantic and apparently it's a chestnut wood. And so I've got to change it. God knows what the um, symbol for chestnuts is. Well, It's the end of the summer, and Ruth's back in Kent to see how the Rogers' plans are progressing. Riverhill only has space to park 30 cars. If it's to be a success in the future, the estate needs to invest in its infrastructure. Ruth wants to know if Ed's done his homework. Well, this is going to be our new car park um, next year, hopefully. And, and, and uh, why have you decided on this side? We've analysed all sort of access points on the estate and um, this probably is still the most optimum. It's very good in the sense of orientation, isn't it? Isn't yeah. Because people know exactly where they should be heading from, presumably yeah. wherever somebody's going to be taking the money will be somewhere. Absolutely, yeah. in, in that direction. So, yes, yeah. Yeah. On her last visit, the panoramic view from Riverhill House was obscured by overgrown yew trees. She's keen to find out if the Rogers have followed her advice and chopped them down. <laughs> Lovely to see you. And to see you too. It's beautiful. It's wonderful, isn't it? I know. No, you head. <laughs> well, absolutely shrunk. It's made quite a difference. The lovely view of the, our own fields. We couldn't and, uh, see any of the fields at all. I mean, it's just... And the beautiful tree, the yeah. oak tree and everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it just looks so much better. Well done. So, Sarah, you've been doing things, so yes. can we sit down and have a chat? But the biggest change of all at River Hill for generations will be the ambitious children's adventure park. What we're proposing is that we have uh, a Himalayan theme. <laughs> what could be more appropriate? Yet, but we want it to be reflecting the history of the Rogers family, yes. but also make it a really exciting place for yes. families to explore together. Yes. So these are just suggestions, really, of um, ideas yes. which we might um, take to uh, to rebrand ourselves. Yes. And I think calling it Himalayan Gardens because there is nowhere like that. No. I mean, you are creating a, a unique brand. Um, perhaps if I can show you the, the, the map, the car park you've seen, yep. people will come from the car park to the area in front of the tea room. Yeah. That is Absolutely. the sort of retail trading area I there. I wondered whether we could call that base camp. Yes, brilliant idea. Um, yeah. And then they go up this hillside path, mm -hmm. possibly with a Sherpa pack. With your, yes. for your children, yes. um, up to this area here, which is where we'd like uh, a, a play area. So that's the Himalayan hideout. hideout. We have asked Adrian Fisher to um, create one of his wonderful mazes for us. Right. I don't think I've ever been as impressed by anybody's thought and imagination on a project as this. Oh, I really you, am. I think thank it's you. wonderful. It does mean a lot to me and well no, I know no, it will no, to I Ed it's brilliant I think it's we, just marvelous we thought a lot about it mm. so and oh, we, well done. we hope um, we hope it takes off we've got confidence now yes you've given us confidence so since Ruth was last at Riverhill Ed's grandmother Evelyn has been ill Ruth wants to make sure that with so many changes afoot she's aware of the bold scheme I'm mightily impressed with the plans for the garden. Mm -hmm. Have you had an opportunity to look and hear about what they're 
proposing to do? Not very much, just a little bit, but I'm thrilled to hear about opening up the woodland and yes. that sort of thing. Does this imply you've been taking a back seat? <laughs> well, I haven't been in hospital and being at home. I, it's the first time I've come out for five weeks, you see, so um, obviously I've taken a back seat. But anyway, it's their do, you know. Yes, yeah. The notion of calling the tea room base camp because, again, of echoing the Himalayas. Does that fill you with horror? <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it's only Himalayan in the springtime. Mm. I mean, I'm all for it being open in the springtime. It's going to be open in the middle of the summer. People won't know what you're talking about. It is essentially an English country house. Your knowledge of the house and the history of it, we talked about Sarah coming and recording. Yes, some well, she started with the garden. As, oh, and up in the woodland a bit too. And did you enjoy doing it? Oh, yes, I love talking. <laughs> I talk... <laughs> love the sound of my own voice, yes. No, no. That's... We all do. <laughs> yes. And I think that's one thing that I really am grateful to you for. You gave the spur that was necessary to get on with that. Good. The maze absolutely boggles me. I mean, I cannot see the point of the maze. I mean, it is a proven model, you know. It's, mm. it's not something where you're just taking it's a straw so and saying, well, this one to this place. But I think we do get back, Mrs Rogers, if I may be so bold as to say, is that... I think you do have to let them get on with it. It's their thing, and, uh, you know, I've got to stand back. But I fear for them, that's all. I just don't want them to get themselves into a real tangle. Oh, this is just that first bit there, Ruth. Sarah's keen to show Ruth the progress they've already made in preparation for the brand-new yeah, so River Hill experience. Just take off the top level there. But this, Ruth, was totally um, impassable. Um, and this until, is all Ed's work? Well, yes, Ed, his brother and, you know, some friends kindly come <laughs> along to help. The first friends of River Hill, I think. Aerial walkways, climbing frames and tree houses are all part of the master plan. Ed's finalising the proposals with specialist playground designer Lyndon Davis. Yeah. Oh, hi! This is Lyndon from Hello. Plain and Simple. Hello, how do you do? Hi. hi. We were just uh, discussing the plans here for um, the Himalayan hideout. And these two big trees, they're well, here? That's what, no, yes, Lyndon's been working on them. They are, Ed, what are they? Sweet chestnut. I mean, this is, again, confirmation that John Rogers did some fantastically beautiful things yeah. because they are such fine and glorious trees. And here they are. I mean, when did anyone last get to see these, Sarah? I shouldn't think anyone has stood on this spot where we're standing now for 50, 80 yeah, years. Yeah, 50, 80 years, enjoying yeah. it anyway. Certainly these... A lovely cedar trees here as well, which um, were that's planted, a, a stunner, some of the original it? plantings in, in 1840. So yeah. it's good that people can enjoy them from this side as well as from the south yeah. side. Now, this looks really good fun. Very good fun. I really enjoy doing it. We yeah. really enjoy unusual ones. Yes, it's, yeah. It's, no, it's not the it's... first plan, is it, Linda? Bet it isn't. But Sarah and Ed are saving the best till last. The scene from their very own Mount Everest summit. This is our proposed viewpoint uh, here. I mean, this is just staggering. Is it worth the climb? <laughs> just. I mean, look, but, you know, it is worth the climb. And this, I would say, is arguably the best view in Kent. And the maze is going to be here. On just this over there, so front. you can Absolutely, look Absolutely, where that flat area is. Ruth's clearly impressed with what the Rogers have achieved. But she wants to see Ed and Sarah put their plans to the test. I think River Hill's going to become a very special place for people to want to come and visit. And I'm charging you with, on my next visit, to see some kids actually trying some of this out. And I think to see their little faces and have their Sherpa packs and use them for feedback and research. Yeah, right. get some Sherpa yeah? here and yeah. organise a day. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be, that'd be fun. <laughs> This is all about the younger generation, Ed and Sarah taking up the baton and really running with it. I'm so impressed with what they've achieved so far. They've been so thoughtful about things, they've shown great commercial acumen. They are absolutely rigorously testing every thought and idea. I just think that they're doing absolutely the right thing. Three weeks later and it's the day of the River Hill trial. All the generations of Rogers are pulling together, hoping to make it a success. To tie in with the theme, Sarah's planned a surprise Himalayan guest, somewhat at Ed's expense. <laughs> no, no, look! 
<laughs> Children are going to be absolutely terrified. <laughs> I think it's a health and safety thing that you can't do this for very long, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you might be a little worried about your hair. Where will you keep your comb? Well, the thing is, my product does say that it stays firm underneath helmets, so <laughs> maybe it will under a Yeti hat. <laughs> With two hours to go, Ruth Watson arrives to oversee proceedings. Hello, morning. Good morning. Nice day. Beautiful. Hello. Oh, hello, Ruth. Hello. Hello, Hi, Ruth. from Activity. Yeah. It's all looking very good nice out there. Nice to see you. Lots of yes. backpacks being assembled. Oh, yes. Well, luckily, we've got some nice people to help this morning. Fantastic. And all these cakes. Yes. We've got a sample menu. So Jane's putting on her... Are you putting on an apron, Jane? I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, I haven't decided. I've got a notepad. <laughs> I like the fact that you're telling people what you're doing and what you're about. That's such a good idea. Everybody is always then up for going with the flow of it. Thirty eager local school children have been drafted in to trial the Rogers Himalayan experience. The event begins with an introduction from a very proud Ed. Welcome, boys and girls, to the River Hill Himalayan Garden. We're so excited that you can join us here today. And River Hill was bought in 1840 by my great, great, great grandfather. He wanted the best plants, so he paid for people to go off and explore the Himalayas in South America, and they risked their lives for him and sent back seeds. And what we're going to do today is show you some of our special shrubs and trees here that have grown from those seeds that were sent back and maybe there has been the sighting of a strange beast in the woods here, so we do have to be very careful. The children are led up into the wooded garden by Sarah to see some of River Hill's rarest specimens. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to spot a special rhododendron with different... No, these are just normal leaves. They find themselves transported back in time to the Himalayas of the 1800s. Can anybody spot this rhododendron with very special leaves? What, what's that rhododendron's name? Fulcanerite. Well done, full Fulcanerite. So, looking around today, we've got all sorts of trees and... and... To help out, Sarah's called on a valiant Victorian plant hunter called George. Can you believe that that one tiny, tiny, tiny little seed can grow up to be a tree 100, 200 feet tall and all from one tiny little seed. Now, I'm going to need a little bit of help from you now because I've got a lot more plants to gather. Jordan, would you like to help George? So, yeah. Yay! Yeah. 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 He sounds like a yeti. Yeah. I suppose he might have. He seems to have had a terrible time. Sarah's so in her own metier here you know she is a teacher and she loves the kids and she's really going with it um she's really in character now so i think this is all great stuff and i love the little pony too look on this one it's there's some quite big ones a purple one yeah, yeah. oh i like that one the children help intrepid george gather interesting seeds but is there something sinister lurking in the woods at river hill house The historic gardens at Riverhill House in Kent are in the process of a major regeneration with the help of Ruth Watson. In a bid to increase revenue and save the historical house from dereliction, Ed and Sarah Rogers are transforming their estate into a Himalayan experience for children. They've invited 30 youngsters to put it to the test, but their mission is fraught with danger. On the way, we're going to be looking out for something. There's been sightings of something strange in the woods. <gasps> Yeti? I'm not sure, because no one in the world has ever caught a Yeti. As the children set off on their adventure, Ruth stays behind with the parents at base camp to help Jane out in the tea room. 
What sort of cake would you like? Carrot cake. Carrot cake. This is, this is where they've gone now. Um, yes. They've gone up to the top. This is what we're hoping to have built. Right. So we're going to have a, a, a new car park too. In those, those enormous trees there, that's where we're going to hope to build the tree houses. Look how tall they are. Anyone know what type of tree that is? That horse yes? Horse chestnut. Well done, a horse chestnut. You're brilliant in your trees, aren't you? Would you like to go and see if you could find that Yeti? Yes! yes. Careful though, Kathy, look at that. The Yeti makes a lucky escape, and the children make it safely to the summit. Hoist the flag! Hoist the flag! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray! And once the luck, hip hip! Hooray! Funny, it looks like we can actually see our skull from here. Right? We are at My favourite bit was probably climbing up the mini Mount Everest 200 feet because it made me feel like I really want to climb the proper Everest. Well, my favourite bit was getting closest to the Yeti and running after the Yeti trying to catch him. A bit of history and some nature and a bit of science too, instead of our usual schoolwork. I, I haven't been here before, but I like it. I might come here again. The experience is clearly a hit with the youngsters. And the parents are impressed too. Are you local? Do you live nearby? I live about 10 minutes away. And did you know River Hill existed? I never had a clue. Everything, the house, the gardens, yeah. it's just been absolutely useful. Yes. There's not anywhere really around here that's, that's mm. like this for them to just run around and exactly. run steam and have a real explore. Yeah. So you'll come back when it's a proper going concern? Definitely. I, I like the idea that everything they're doing is natural. Yes. So there's no, no plastic things yeah. going yeah. in. That, yeah. yeah, I like that. The trial has proved a huge success. All that remains is for Ruth to bring the family together. What a successful afternoon. <laughs> I have to commend you for doing such a brilliant job. I really, I mean, all the preparation, the satchels, the tea, the cakes, everything about it. I'm just wonderful. We're thrilled it's gone so well. Yeah, <laughs> very relieved, very relieved. So do you now feel... Um, confident that this can work. Yeah, I, I still have great reservations about the maze because I can't see the point of it, but the climbing frame and the walk I think is wonderful. Now, what about um, Jane, your, your husband, Ed, your, your father? Um, do you think he would approve of all of this? Yeah. Before looking down at us saying, good heavens. <laughs> but, you know... But pleased? I, oh, pleased, yes, because, you know, he loved River Hill, mm. absolutely loved it. Also, actually, Johnny and I probably would not have been brave enough, and I'm... Probably not as <laughs> powerful as my daughter-in-law. Oh, I'm terrified of her as well. <laughs> I just hope that your generation, Sarah and Ed, is going to have a, a wow of a time and that, you know, you will be able to leave something to your children for them to look forward to rather than to slightly dread. And most importantly, knowing that the house and the gardens are stabilised, they're going to carry on for future generations. Well, that's what mm. I would like. Touch yes, yes. 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 So. it would be wonderful. I think we mm. all hope that. Yes. Mm. Yeah. My work here is done. Field Hall is an architectural gem dating back to the 15th century. But it's not just the property that's important. The extraordinary collection inside makes this one of the nation's truly hidden treasures. James Cartland has spent the last 21 years restoring the house. Now in his 60s, he's struggling to keep it going. It's got too much for me. There are too many things to do here and I've been doing them all. Can businesswoman Ruth Watson help secure Carnfield Hall and its amazing contents for the future? I think you might say that I'm slack-jawed with amazement. And persuade James that semi-retirement is the best way forward. How are you 
you spending your days then? You must be joking. Yeah, stupid it's interesting. Question. It's not stupid. Because... It is a stupid question. No, but it I'm, isn't. just forget it. Carnfield Hall in Derbyshire is a Grade II listed manor dating back to the late 1400s. Fervent antiques collector James Cartland bought the abandoned property in 1987 and has devoted his life to bringing it back to its former glory. When I first came here, the house was in a state of complete dereliction. No plumbing, no electricity, holes through the roof. James is a second cousin to romantic novelist Barbara Cartland. He's had a love of antiques since he was a child. My collecting bug started when I was about five years old. I reckon I must have been hit on the head. And it's uh, been a disease ever since, completely incurable. Today, Carnfield Hall is home to an astonishing array of treasures, trinkets and curios that have been lovingly collected over the years. It all fits together. It's a wonderful time capsule, and people who come here, they think it's always been here. James opens the house on an informal basis for tours, but the income hardly makes a dent in the hall's £20,000 annual maintenance costs. Only a few people come, and probably brought in about £1,500. Not exactly going to keep the roof on. Twice divorced, James now lives a reclusive life at Carnfield Hall, surrounded by his beloved possessions. Isolated from the modern world and in his 60s, he's finding it increasingly difficult to keep up with the demands of the house. With no children of his own, James has decided to leave the estate to his godson, Robin Hanawa but he wants to ensure that his heir gets a welcome inheritance rather than a tiresome burden. You never end up with a house like this if you're sensible. Businesswoman Ruth Watson has helped historic houses up and down the country turn their fortunes around with her practical advice and direct manner. Today, Ruth's in Derbyshire to meet James and help him safeguard Carnfield Hall for the next generation. I think Ruth will either run a mile or I will, I'm not sure which. Hello. Hello, how nice of you to come. <laughs> you must be James. I am, yes. And I'm Ruth. And yes. what a very interesting house. Because your name's Cartland and I've got to ask the question, are you related to the Grand Dame? Abs absolutely, yes. What relationship? Ooh, well, my great uncle was her grandfather. Well, I'm glad you don't share the same taste in mascara. I decided today not to wear the pink frock. <laughs> Follow me. Over the next few days, Ruth will formulate a plan to preserve Carnfield for the future. She begins her tour in the Great Hall. I think you might say that I'm slack-jawed with amazement. <laughs> this is incredible. And there is everything from taxidermy to pewter to bath screens. But, I, I mean, how long? I mean, did you acquire this? How, OK, tell me about this. Did, did you move in and half of it was here? or No. Have you, I mean, have you brought not. it no. all in? No, it was, it's all been brought in. There was nothing here when I came here at all, not one single solitary thing. So you're house. responsible for all of it? I'm afraid I'm totally responsible, or irresponsible, perhaps. I think a large collection of feather dusters is required, that's for sure. Oh, keep the, on top of it, really. Do you? And I have a blitz. So? I have a blitz on it about twice a year. Right. And what about this extraordinary doll's house behind you? Yes. I think I need to see what's inside. Yes. Do you want to have a look? This is sort of like a little microcosm of what the house appears to be, and that you don't seem to be content with real life house. You need to have a, another small scale. Because one I've run well. out of room. Well, I think I'd better continue with the tour, don't you? Upstairs in the real house, every surface, shelf, sideboard, and wall space is covered. Well, I knew we weren't going to be coming into a minimalist room. <laughs> I don't think I have ever been anywhere quite like this, apart from a museum. And, of course, in a museum, it's all behind glass and you can't actually touch it. 
here it's all sort of just used. I apologise, I'm not actually I looking worry. at no, you. No, <laughs> I'd much rather you look at the furniture. I realise <laughs> that I've never been in a room where one's eye is so taken by everything. You just kind of, you know, you alight on one thing and then you're on to the next thing and the next thing and it's never-ending. Well, I think I'd like to see some more of Miss Havisham's house, if I may. <laughs> there is no doubt that James has amassed an impressive collection, but it's the aged house that requires his constant attention and money. Is everything panelled? Is the whole house panelled? No, but a lot of the rooms upstairs are. Right. It opens up, you know. This is how the whole house is built. Oh, you, you can see, see the Yes, and the framework. Roman numerals showing how it's all put together. And a bit of um, activity. Oh, that's a bit of our Death Watch beetle. Just imagine if that fell to bits and the whole... Would the whole place come down like a pack of cards? Doesn't bear thinking about <laughs> I love that. I, I love it too, and I love the <laughs> sort of whole archaeological dig, yes. you know, thing. I mean, it's fantastic. That is really amazing. Clever, isn't it, though? Very clever. James has an intricate knowledge of his curiosities and has a story to tell about each and every item. Do you seem to be keen on fans? I've collected fans since I was a little boy, when I was given four right. of them. And there's a lovely example just here. I was going to say, how many hundreds have you oh, got? Several. And there's a beautiful one there. Look at that. What is this? Ostrich feather. Take Can it, it come just, up? Yeah, absolutely. Open it up. And uh, handy if you do a fan dance. Actually, it was a court fan from, from Edward VII's court. It really does kick up a breeze yeah. as well, doesn't Actually, it? Actually, you probably needed it in the, some yeah. ball. It's riveting, James. I have to say, it's riveting. You're changing, you see. <laughs> Having explored the house and what's inside it, Ruth is keen to find out more about its curator. James, we're in your kitchen, and this is where collecting sort of tends rather into sort of step-toe world. Because I'm appalled! I'm absolutely appalled! I know I'm not here to inspect your domestic arrangements, well, well, but it is unbelievable. I've never poisoned anybody yet. Do you feel as if you're in control of the house or is the house in control of you? Oh, I haven't a clue. I can't even begin to answer that. Have you got a business experience, financial oh, yes. experience? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What, I ran it? a very good business before I came here. Right. Which but, I sold. But in, in, in what sort of area? Oh, I owned a museum. And, um, <laughs> so, and shops, so not a million miles shops, away No, not a million this. miles. I had an antique shop, two antique shops. And, and were they uh, successful? Very successful, yeah. And you don't have a, a natural heir of your own, so... That's right. So where's, who is going to take it on? Robin, who's my godson. Does Robin have experience in this field at all? Not really, no. How much are you worried about the house and its future? I'm very worried about it because the costs of running it are between fifteen and 20000 a year, right. I'd say. Now, if I stop doing all the repairs myself, mm. it's going to cost a lot more. Mm. And at the moment, I can do them. You know, in 10 years, I'll be 71, mm. and uh, I won't be able to nip up ladders mm. and repair mm. things. And we'll have to hire somebody. Yeah, sure. And that's where the costs mount yeah. up, and that's when we'll lose it. So we're looking at trying to find a system that will produce enough income, enough capital for the next 10 years for Robin to be able to inherit something that's actually a going concern, that as it were. That pays for itself. Simple, really. <laughs> you have to give James credit for actually restoring this house and preserving the fabric of the building, the roof. It's so important. But what there is is this underlying feeling that it's actually chaos, that he really isn't focused. And I think he kind of knows that. What needs to happen is he has to have a plan for how to produce an income for this house that's going to allow him to pass it on to Robin as a treasure, not a burden. Opening his house to Ruth's scrutiny is proving a struggle for James Cartland. She certainly needs to go to charm school, I think. But he's amazed when he hears her suggestions for Carnfield's future. I never could have believed in a million years that that's what she'd say. Carnfield Hall in Derbyshire is a forgotten time capsule filled with remarkable secrets. The derelict house was saved from demolition in 1987 by antiques expert James Cartland, who restored the handsome property. Oh, it's my whole life. Yes, I absolutely adore it. The more I've got into it, the more I love it. I know every inch of this house. I could tell you where every Death Watch beetle lives. 
The estate has Viking origins, but the manor that stands here today was built in the mid-1400s. The distinguished facade was added in the 18th century. Despite years of neglect, the house has retained many original features, including two grand oak staircases and an intricately carved fireplace in the Great Hall, both of which date back to the 1600s. The house has a chequered history. In 1627, rebel servants raided the dead squire's loot. The Reverend Francis Revel housed his wife, family and even his mistress here in the 1700s and the ghosts of an old maid and a murdered gentleman are said to haunt the property. But what makes this residence truly unique is the remarkable lifetime collection of curiosities gathered together by its owner, James Cartland. Now in his 60s, he's struggling to keep the estate afloat. Ruth Watson's been called in to devise a way of generating a healthy income at Carnfield Hall so that James can take more of a back seat in the future. She's concerned that James's heir, Robin Hanower, isn't left with a liability when his godfather dies. Robin, when you inherit the house, I mean, do you have any plans for um, what you would do with the interior? My wife and I are both collectors, so I'm sure we'd keep on collecting to a degree. Most of the major rooms, I think we're pretty well quite happy with as they are. I think right. uh, it's, it's the whole charm of the place. There are obviously some things that would be changed to suit us, perhaps, but to be asked, obviously, to become James's successor is a, mm. an honour and a, a privilege. Mm. It's extremely flattering, and mm. uh, I hope that we do him proud when the time comes. With Robin living 170 miles away in Surrey, Ruth wants to know if he's had any thoughts on how the 90-acre estate can reinvent itself. Have you had ideas about how it could produce an income? I know James is keen to kind of keep the park as the sort of the profit-making side and perhaps keep the house a bit more private. We're really open to use it to its maximum effect. Talking with James, I felt a lack of focus. Um, a little bit, perhaps. I mean, there are obviously certain elements to that, the whole estate, if you can call it that. Um, there's the park, the house, and I think that he's obviously now keen to kind of get motivated with regards to making it generate its own income to as great a degree as we can. Ruth is beginning to realise that with its prime location close to major road networks, the answer to Carnfield's financial problems lies within the grounds and not the manor. James earns little income doing occasional house tours. To increase turnover, he started work on a new tea room. But Ruth's more concerned about the state of the facility that will service it. Here's the pantry. Right. I know it looks an appalling mess, Ooh. but we're just about to um, have a blitz on it and make it into a modern kitchen so that it can pass all the health and safety rules. I mean, looking at it now, it's more like the garage yes. than the pantry. I'm a bit horrified about the washing machine. It's 30 years old, You're not right? still using yes. the washing machine. Yes. You're not. Yes, 30 years old. I'm sorry, if I put a load of washing in there, I would expect it to come out dirtier and rustier than when it went in. No, it still washes clothes beautifully. <laughs> the thing is, environmental health will want to come and examine oh, the premises. Absolutely. And they will want to make sure that every single surface is pristine and clean and cleanable. What is the time frame for this kitchen we're to going be to get it. We're going to get it done this summer. It's the next thing to do. Used to doing things his own way, and in his own time, James is beginning to take umbrage with Ruth's direct approach. Well, I think it's very interesting having, having Ruth here. I, I'm not sure I, I, I've learnt anything. Um, and um, she certainly needs to go to charm school, I think. Every nook and cranny is taken up by the Carnfield curiosities, and Ruth sets off on her own to explore. Up in the attic rooms, she's surprised by what she discovers. It was a magnificent doll's house, but, I mean, most of this is just mouldering books and fabrics. I mean, this is an addiction, this collecting business. Ha! 
This is obviously James's motto, not to be slung. It says it all. Back downstairs, Ruth loses herself in the sheer magnitude of James's obsession. This is really sweet. It's like a little mini antique shop. And everything feels a lot more sort of placed in here. Um, perhaps it's just a bit more feminine. And look here. Sleeves, once worn by the Duchess of Kent, the mother of Queen Victoria. There's a real royalty thread through a lot of the possessions that James has. And what's interesting is, that unless they're labelled, you just don't know. You don't get the connection. And I think this is something which really ought to be pulled out. With this in mind, Ruth sets off to do her research. She's on her way to visit the former homes of two equally eclectic collectors. 25 miles south of Carnfield is Colk Abbey, a stunning Baroque mansion that's home to one family's huge collection of treasures. Ruth is given a tour by house manager John Parkinson. So this is a classic corridor at Cork Abbey. Um, the National Trust took over in the mid-80s. We opened in 1989, and um, we very much present it as we found yes. it. So <laughs> hence all the, uh, the faded wallpaper. It goes on forever, this house, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. it's really, oh, my goodness. This is Savornsey Harper Crew's boyhood bedroom, actually. As you see it now, uh, this was how we found it. It was, uh, it was photographed very carefully. Uh, when the trust took over. Rather than renovate Cork, the National Trust changed nothing. The house and its contents have been painstakingly preserved and appear just as they were discovered when the Harper family left. There's still huge cracks in the ceiling. Yeah, the, the structure was made safe. Uh, stainless steel pins were inserted above this ceiling just to hold it up. I think most of this wallpaper was removed carefully and then the dry rot was sorted out, the plaster was replaced and then the wallpaper was put back. But they, they preserved all the cracks and everything just so that you still get the feel of it being a sort of abandoned area of the house. And I'd like to think that as you walk down the corridors, you're, you're discovering the place for the first time. The enchanting spirit that's been maintained at Cork Abbey attracts over 140,000 visitors a year. But Ruth is keen to explore a more intimate space that has closer symmetry with Carnfield. Next stop for Ruth, Spitalfields, in the heart of London's East End. Like James Cartland, the late Dennis Sever was an avid collector. Number 18 Folgate Street is a fitting memorial to a legendary aficionado. David Milne is the current curator. Can you just talk me through how it all began? Dennis bought the house in the late 70s and he created a story to give the house a substance. Mm -hmm. So all of the rooms are inhabited by the family that Dennis created. There is a great deal of theatricality about this. Every single item within the house has been strategically placed to create a rich tableau as though Sever's fictional family are still living here. This is the dining room of Isaac Gervais who is the owner of the house mm -hmm. and in the portrait behind us He's wearing a wig. On the chair is his wig. So instantly he inhabits that space. There's a letter addressed to him. And I believe he's just drunk from his glass and taken a bite from that peach. And knocked his pipe out, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Each room tells a story relating to different historical ages. It's a rich, sensory feast. We're now headed into 1760 the master's um, most private quarters, his bedroom. People came to see this house when Dennis was alive. This was his, his bedroom. People visit the house and they see things and sometimes they think that we forgot to put something away. His shoes are on the floor with the socks where he left them. You know, I'm here to take care of this house, take, take care of the collection and take it into the future mm. because one day I'm going to be gone. Mm. But actually this house and its collection and the memory of Dennis will live on. Mm. 
Having done her research, Ruth returns to Carnfield Hall with her findings. Hello, James. Hello. In the dining room, a nervous James awaits Ruth's appraisal. First thing I would like to talk about is the inheritance issue, because obviously you want Robin, your godson, to inherit, and I'm quite sure that you don't want to land him with the most enormous tax burden. What I would like to see is a sort of five to ten year plan of you getting Robin and his family more ensconced here so that you can do a natural handover before you pop your clocks, wouldn't it? It would, yes, absolutely. You're a really sweet person and I think it would be horrible for you to end up staggering around this place like at some lonely old bird, you know, oh, it, would be, yeah. it would be quite tragic. And I think it would be lovely if he could be here with his family so that you have got that feeling of support around you, you know, and family love. Oh, I, I quite agree. <laughs> Ruth is convinced that the answer to Carnfield's future security lies not within the house, but in the 90 acres of unused parkland. She wants James to stage events on the land, managed not by himself, but by professional organisers. Secondly, making income for the house. Now, I actually think this is a relatively easy thing to do. There's a company I can put you in touch with who actually organised a variety of sales from just regular car boot sales and, of course, antique sales. Now, the virtue of that is, first of all, that you can have a nice mix of events going on. Just up the road, there's a place that's gaining somewhere between two and six thousand pounds every event, net. And if I tell you that you are allowed to do 14 of these throughout the year without needing any planning permission, this adds up to something in the region of, I think, a reasonably safe 50,000. But I think, given your interest in antiques, what I'd like to see is you having a store for antiques as well. Not just to buy, but also to sell things. I think that sounds incredibly sensible. It's exactly the direction we wanted to go. Using the land to bring in revenue will ease the constant pressure of the house having to earn its keep. But Ruth still wants James to refine his exquisite collection. What needs to happen is for you to get rid of some of the outright junk. Mm. Now, you know there is junk. Mm. Up in the attics, I would say 70% is just outright junk. And also, perhaps, devoting the attics to the dolls' houses, along with everything allied with the dolls' houses. You know, the prams, the teddy bears, all the kind of paraphernalia of childhood. I think that could be something that was curated, but I think the rest of it should pretty much stay exactly as it is. So what I'm saying is not to tidy up, not to dust, not to clean it all up, not to change it. That's the last thing I would suggest you should do. What I think needs to happen here is guided tours, but actually very focused, so that mm. actually you pull out the things that you love. And it could be completely pertinent to your family history. It could be Royalty. There's a real thread of royal connections. So it's not just one big blur. I would like to commend that you go down to London to look at Folgate Street and Dennis Sever's house. And what he did there was to evoke the whole history of the house, everything that actually really sort of takes people away from the 21st century. And if ever there was a house that takes people away from the 21st century, then it is this house, Carnfield Hall. And I think you should really, really maximise on that. Mm. What makes the Carnfield collection truly charming is James's intricate knowledge of every item. Ruth is worried that when he dies, this wealth of information will be lost forever. You could augment this by actually putting together an audio tape. That also means that it's preserved for all time as well. So that, you know, after your death, we don't have to worry about Robin not knowing about things because it will be there. And I think it would be a marvellous thing to do for a whole national heritage. Uh, the problem is that we get so few visitors that it's never been worth it. Right. It's like having a guidebook. Yeah. Uh, we need to be able to get more visitors. How but do we get them? you're going to get more visitors because you're going to have this little website, right? And the website, we will make sure, is made known to all the tourist boards, all the heritage people. There's so many agencies that would mm. love to have this on their books. The key to Carnfield's long-term success is to focus on the future. But Ruth's worried that James doesn't have the ability to do so. 
I don't doubt that there is intent, but I think what's needed is absolutely a push. I think it's absolutely correct that I'm not terribly focused. There are too many things to do here, and it's just got too mm. much for me. Simple. Mm. But, uh, no, and I have to say, I, I'm actually quite surprised by what you've said because um, we haven't exactly got on terribly well during some of this. I haven't agreed with some of the things I thought you were going to say mm -hmm. and it's been a great surprise and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. So there we are. Good. But is James truly on board with Ruth's suggestions? I have to say that I've slightly changed my mind about Ruth. I, I, um, <laughs> I'm rather impressed by what's happened actually. I, Never could have believed in a million years that that's what she'd say. I, I'm still utterly bemused. I, mm, amazing. After such warm praise from James, the atmosphere at Carnfield Hall turns decidedly frosty. Hello, oh, James. How are no, you? No, I don't do that. I'm you sorry. don't do kisses. And for Ruth, there's no imminent sign of a thaw. It's not stupid. Because... It is a stupid question. No, but it isn't I'm, just stupid. forget it. Historic Carnfield Hall in the Midlands is in trouble. Advancing in years, James Cartland is struggling single-handedly to keep the house afloat. Ruth Watson's been called in to come up with money-making ventures that will allow James to take a step back. I'm not really very business-minded. The trouble is that I, I see this place in a different light. It's my home. And uh, I don't know, I, I just find the whole thing completely wearing. With Carnfield's close proximity to the M1 and the A38, Ruth's keen to see the unused 90 acres of parkland utilised for profit. She's arranged for car boot organiser Mike Snow to visit and meet with James and his heir, godson Robin Hanauer. I mean, considering you're so near the uh, motorway, it's, it's really got a peaceful uh, aura about it, hasn't it? It's, it's yeah. Good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the other thing we were wondering is how we organise this and who would do what. I would be responsible for doing all the advertising, the toilets, the staffing, the signs, everything really, getting the permissions. Yep. I've got public liability for as many sites as I want, so we've got all that in place. In, in essence, it is a risk-free way of potentially earning, you know, some, some good money out of it. Car boot sales are hugely successful, and with such an expansive estate, Mike realises that James is sitting on a gold mine. We would come to an agreement on uh, how the turnover and the costs were sort of distributed between yes, us. and we could just in... work that out depending on, you know, how we felt at the time, I think. Why don't we have um, some trial events this year, see how it goes, Probably and then idea. use that as a platform for doing something yeah. next year. Just the sort of thing we want. Sounds so ideal, isn't it? Put it on radio as well. Absolutely. Carnfield Hall is back. That's right, <laughs> yes. You've... That's it. Like Ruth, Robin's keen to maintain Carnfield's quaintness. Ooh. But feels that James needs to be brought into the 21st century. Robin's following Ruth's advice by starting work on a new website. Oh, bugger. Mobile connection, not possible. Brilliant. But all isn't going quite to plan. Well, something's happened. The connection has packed up. And James has found himself something more pressing to occupy his mind. We were going to look at the basic website. Oh my God, the lead was falling to bits. It's fairly simple. Five pages, a page featuring the house, a page featuring the park, um, a page featuring the events, and then a, a contacts and uh, links page. I'm sure, Rob, this isn't how the British Museum would do it with a bit of sellotape. Interesting. Yeah. Ah, marvellous invention, sellotape. Stick the heirlooms together. I don't. I think we're going to have much luck with this, though. You carrier pigeons were more useful. <laughs> yeah. Robin has finally managed to get a signal, albeit outside. I just click on enter. Ruth wants James to collate and preserve his collection for posterity, and she's asked him to visit Dennis Sever's house in London. I know all about this house, so. Oh, I see. He's done it in a way that kind of makes it interactive, so that... Oh, yes. Well, it's a family living in it. Yeah. As if they're there, and they've just nipped out of the room. 
but James is far from keen on paying a visit. What it's got to do with something like this and what we're trying to do here is nothing to do with it. Yeah. I won't go to London. I just, I don't like London and I never go anywhere anyway. James was initially enthusiastic about Ruth's ambitions for Carnfield Hall, but as the weeks have gone by, he's become increasingly disenchanted. The original thing was that we didn't know how to make this place pay for itself because I'm not the greatest businessman in the world. The trouble is I'm trying to run what is actually quite a large estate. I don't have any staff apart from one person half a day a week trying to keep the lawns cut, the house sorted out, and it, it isn't an easy thing. And I don't think she understands that at all. One suggestion that James has embraced, however, is utilising the sprawling estate for profit. It's late August, and local event organiser Mike Snow has been busy publicising a trial car boot fair. Look forward to seeing you here. All right, bye. Up to 70 booters. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Not bad for a first stop, is it? Yeah, yeah. We'll probably get some more here. Yeah, I do, I do, yeah. It's looking good. Right, OK. The event has attracted over 200 eager bargain hunters and more than 70 stall holders. Today shows that the, this site has actually got quite a lot to offer. This actually shows that there's something to go at. Ruth wanted James to stage a clear out and have his own stall. But he's got other ideas. Oh, hello. Here's my pound. I had to go raise the pig. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Terrific. There you are. There we are, and you get the money. That's lovely. Thank you very much. There. Thank you. Bye. With so much land, Mike is convinced that Carnfield car boots could run every weekend year round and accommodate many more stall holders. I think for a trial it's very good. I mean, normally you would build up week on week, so perhaps within uh, you know a couple of months you could be doing say three times what we've done today. I think the potential here is enormous. The day's been a huge success, and Mike wants to give James his share of the takings. In terms of the financial side of it... I don't want anything for today. So oh, no, no, you must. No, 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 no absolutely, no, no. yeah. You, you keep what you make today. No, 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 I can't do because that. Because I think that it's... Uh, I was going to give you... I was going to give you half of uh, the, the yeah, well, well, let's leave all that. Um, I'm quite happy for you to... Once we've tried one out... Yeah. And I think I said that originally. Well, I, I, my aim was to give you half of the, a turnover of the day. No, well, you know, <laughs> you've had to advertise it in your work. Right. No, I think that's only fair. It's four months since Ruth's last visit to Carnfield, and she's back in Derbyshire to check on progress. I haven't seen James for several months, but he seemed very agreeable to most of the suggestions I made. I can see there's a bit of new palisade up there guarding something or other, so hopefully that's a sign of other things that he's done. But Ruth's about to get a rather lukewarm reception. Hello! Oh, a footstep. Hello! James, how are no, you? No, I don't do that. I'm oh, you sorry. don't do kisses? No. Oh, God! Don't fall you? over the mouse, which I won't the fall cat over has... the mouse. Is that a, a, a present for me, a warning for me? What's that all about? I think about? it could be both. It's from the cat, yes. So, how's life? Oh, not too bad, yes. You had the car boot sale, didn't you? Yeah, that was quite fun. Got quite a lot of people, I think. How much money did you make out of it? Uh, well, we didn't make any money out of it because that was never, ever the case. Did you join in? No. No? Too busy. So I went and had a look and bought something, of course. You bought something? I bought something. So you didn't sell anything? No, no, no? absolutely not. No, why and, not? Uh, no stall out no, for you? No, no stall. But it would be nice if you had a stall as well, don't you think? It'd be fun. Oh, I couldn't be bothered, really, but... Um... That all sounds pretty negative. <laughs> all right, well, may I come in? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Ruth might have got an indifferent greeting, 
but at least some progress has been made in the house. Ah, the pantry. Oh, yes, yeah. the pantry. Yes, it's Interior. nearly finished. Yes, I've got all the plumbing's done and, um, yeah, I've been painting it bits and of time. the washing machine's had a bit of a clean. Yes, all of it's been cleaned up now. I was really thunderstruck by your comments, but you were right, of course. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's um, looking better. It's a huge improvement. With at least one room shaping up, Ruth's keen to find out what else has been going on at Carnfield. One of the things, of course, that I wanted you to do was to do the audio tour. Yes. Um, any developments on that front? No. No. Nope. Haven't done anything about that at all. Right. But the tours are really not the problem. What so. about the fact that only you are completely <laughs> aware of what everything is and the fact that your demise would mean that some of this became inexplicable to other people, whereas Hold you... Hold a seance. You reckon you'd come back and... <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I think if you can't do it in real no, you're time, right. you're not likely to do it in spiritual time. No, you're, <laughs> it was finding the time. Um, but, so, so what, how are you spending your days then? You um, must be joking. I don't... There's never a day here when there aren't things to do. You must be joking. Well, so tell me go, what you do. Oh, go, oh, I'm not going to go into that now. Good Lord, well, no, what a no, stupid it's question. Interesting. It's not stupid because... It is a stupid question. No, but it isn't Just stupid. forget it. I, I'm not going to go into that. It's far too boring. OK, so, um, Doll's House, not being upstairs, nursery on the top floor, mu child museum. You can't get people up there. Why not? Because of fire regulations. OK, so, uh, really, um, nothing much has changed then? No. No, well, um, because it's, it doesn't, you know, it, it really can't. So, impasse? Impasse, absolutely. OK, all right, I shall stop talking then. James's unexpected resistance has unnerved Ruth. I confess I'm a little perplexed about James's reaction because on my first visit he was so positive about some of my suggestions and he really seems to have done precious little. He seems very negative about so many things. I'm hoping that because he loves his collection so much I can cajole him to show me some of the precious best things that he really loves. Maybe that will warm him up. <laughs> If she's to win James around, Ruth's got her work cut out. Keen to see the unique stories of Carnfield's treasures preserved, she starts by getting James to talk her through a rather noble part of his collection. The royal things. Now, um, you've got a number of pieces. Well, yes, I've got things like a lock of Edward IV's hair, but there's not much left now since okay. a burglar pinched the box. Can we go see? Yes, 1483, yeah? that is. Gosh. And... Uh, Yes. There it is, Ruth. Right. Here's Queen Victoria's signature. When Queen Victoria became Queen, she had her first council meeting, and that's the blot from the first time she ever wrote her signature as Queen. Am I looking mirror fashion? Yes, that's right. And, and those are um, Princess Charlotte's wedding stockings. She was the daughter of George IV. They're still tiny feet, aren't well, they? Well, she was very young. She was about 18 or 19. Right. And she died in childbirth very quickly. And this uh, is George IV's pocket handkerchief. Yeah, How do people come by these things? Is it servant stealing? I expect he dropped it somewhere. Yeah. And it's got a hole in the middle, so he must have had a cold. Mm. Yeah. But uh, quite fun, this. I just like the historical context of it. Yes. I just think it's wonderful. If it hasn't got a story, you're not quite so interested. No, it makes it much more interesting if it's got yeah. a story. So After context all... is everything. Yes. I mean, yeah. a, a wedding dress isn't much use unless mm. you know who it, is, it who was. It? No. Or, you know, some interesting mm. artefact. Mm. I think it's far more fun. But that is partly why I wanted you to do as much tape recording, whether it's for an audio tour, whether it's just tape recordings, because so much of this is in your head and your head I know alone. It is. Oh, it is true. I mean, we've always thought of doing it. Um, but, uh, yes. To improve the estate's revenue, Ruth's ultimate aim is to outsource outdoor events so James can take a back seat. But having been at the helm for over 20 years, he's used to doing everything himself. Do you think delegation is possibly part of the problem that you're not a delegator? Well, I can't see the point of a lot of it. I, I'd, yes, I suppose that's true up to a point, but there's not... I'd, I can't see the point of getting other people to do things that I can do myself, mm. and that's something I'd... But it was a question of time, wasn't it, really, whether, you know, having the time to do all the things... Yes, but that's necessary. not going to alter the fact. Right. That's not going to alter the time, is it? Because I'm going to have to be there. 
Long-term change at Carnfield is going to be gradual. But eager to convince James that the parkland is the key to the estate's future, Ruth wants him to trial a second event. What about if I were to suggest theatrical events? It's a company that does marvellous, sort of rather extravagant Shakespearean, um, slightly exaggerated things. Yes, I outside. think it'd be terrific. I mean, anything like that, I think they're wonderful, those things. This has to be one of the most maddening and frustrating meetings I've ever had because at the end of my last meeting, James was so up for things and was really responsive to my suggestions, but actually everything that's pertaining to the house and the collection and his role within it, he is denying. He doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to do it. And the house is of massive importance. The only godsend is that I always thought it would be the events that would bring the money in. And I think the only way forward is to concentrate on that and put on another event. But with the summer drawing to a close, the race is on to put on a successful show. And to persuade James that this is the way forward. James Cartland wants to see Carnfield Hall earn its keep so he can enjoy semi-retirement. Businesswoman Ruth Watson has come up with a solution that will bring in revenue and allow James to take a back seat. Carnfield is to stage its first theatrical event, but with the end of the summer fast approaching, there's only nine days left to organise it. In the past, all the hard work fell to James, but today, Ruth's drafted in local events organiser, Rachel Morley. Odd Sox Theatre Company tour the country performing boisterous adaptations of Shakespeare classics. This is like a jack-in-a-box. Everything's, you know, it arrived in a lorry and it's all extraordinary. Ruth returns for her final visit to see if James is, at last, managing to delegate. Well, I have to admit, I didn't give them very much time to get this event sorted out, but looking at the red and white canopies, it's all looking very cheerful. Whether James will be quite so cheerful, I don't really know, because he certainly didn't seem to find my presence very welcome on my last visit. But, you know, who knows? Who knows? James, this is all rather glorious. Oh, you've come just in time, <laughs> time for rehearsals. Oh, it's really, it's really fantastic. good. Good fun, and also nice to see sort of animation really, around the really place. Lovely. Yeah, because it's all a bit of a spoof, isn't it? On Richard the Third, is that right? Richard That's III? right. Yes, Who yeah. I'm rather a fan of. I'm, Are you? I'm sure it's all made up. The nasty things about mm. him. It was a spin mm. from Henry the Seventh. Yes. Not the sort of chap to go about murdering his nephews. I no, think. No. Well. In dark passages. <laughs> As the audience arrives, James is beginning to realise the true potential of Ruth's ideas. This is going to be really good fun. This is going to be the beginning of a great future here. Hello. A long weekend of performances like this could net James £9,000. All he has to do is provide the land. With the show in full swing, Ruth prizes James away to reflect on the last five months. James, that was a really good evening, wasn't it? I haven't enjoyed myself so much for a long time. Fantastic. <laughs> really good. I don't like Shakespeare, but that makes Shakespeare come alive. And watching the audience, yeah. they were all riveted. Everything, everybody from two years old to 102. Just doing some rough figures um, about the Odd Sox event tonight. If you were to do three of those a year with, say, about 500 people, which I think is perfectly possible with more notice, mm. that would realise you about £9,000 net. 
Yeah, I mean, they've is, all got to be obviously have a, a, a large piece of it as well. No, so. that would realise you nine thousand pounds net. Really? Yes. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. Which is very, very good. Yes. Yeah. You look as if, certainly for the outside events, that next year could be very lucrative and very successful. Well, I hope so, yes. I mean, I know we've had our ups and downs mm. in all this, mm. but I, I wouldn't have done all this without you. And it has galvanised me into action. Well, that's and, very um, generous of you to say uh, so. Thank you. But, I mean, it's absolutely correct that. I, yeah. But, well, uh, when, anyway, thank you very much. You know, the real problem here is not that it's falling down. It's that you're falling down. Gradually. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. Well, I can't do what I used to do 20 no, years ago. Exactly. And, oh, I mean, no. it's really to make sure that you and mm. everything around you is secure for the next 20, oh, 30 yes. years. Well, I think now we've got over the first hurdle, really. Mm. I've got great faith now that we'll be able to sort it out. If we can't, there's something seriously wrong. Mm. Uh, with me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably is, anyway. Well, I wish you luck. Thank I you really very do. much. This is Heath House, an imposing Gothic Victorian mansion set in a 480-acre estate in Staffordshire. John and Flavia are the latest in a long line of the Phillips family, who have lived on this site since the mid-16th century. But despite their best efforts, they can no longer cope with its demands and have put the estate up for sale. There was no other alternative other than to, to put it on the market, which is what happened. It's never been easy for the Phillipses because they've never had enough money to run it happily. But not everyone in the family is in agreement. If it goes and everything in the house goes with it, you will never, ever have anything like that again. Can businesswoman Ruth Watson help the Phillips keep this fine part of our national heritage in the family and find a role for Heath House in the modern world? Nobody's recently married an heiress, which would help. They don't think I can wipe my bottom. You've got to stop sitting on the pot and actually start pissing. Heath House is a Grade II listed mansion built in the Gothic style in the late 1830s. Eleven years ago, John Phillips retired from the family business and was looking forward to a quiet life. But when his mother died in 2002, he and wife Flavia were forced to take on Heath House and all that it entails. Heath House represents work in a big way. To keep it going, you don't stop. You just do not stop. The elderly couple divide their time between the comfortable family home in Worcestershire and Heath House, 75 miles away. We don't live here full-time because in the winter it is extremely expensive to have the heating on. But with just one housekeeper and one gardener on site, most of the work tending the 480-acre estate with its 22 lawns and countless rooms falls to John and Flavia. Really, by your 70s, you think, well, let the next generation take over. The Phillips have two bachelor sons. 40-year-old Justin has no desire to take on the house, but Ben, 42, is keen to inherit. For very good reason, John is not convinced this is such a good idea. Everything that the family has had has been spent in large measure on this house and keeping it going. With this in mind, John and Flavia believe their only option is to sell up. It's a decision Ben thinks his parents will live to regret. It is such a, an emotional wrench for my parents for, for all sorts of reasons um, that it's very difficult for people to just calm down and think clearly about this thing. Pensions advisor Ben lives in London where he lodges with his aunt, Anthea. She knows the commitment that her sister Flavia has made to Heath House. Flavia didn't want this house in the first place. That was her wedding vows to John. I will marry you as long as I don't have anything to do with this house. It costs £70,000 a year to run the estate 
and John and Flavia are fearful of allowing their eldest son to take on such a burden. Benjamin um, is, how would we describe Benjamin? A he's, cerebral. He's cerebral, uh, not practical. He could have good organisational abilities. What, Benjamin? He could have. Struggling to keep the ancestral home going, the Phillips had no alternative but to put the house up for sale for three and a half million pounds. It's increasingly difficult to balance the books. There is no capital left. But two years later, it remains unsold and the family is in real trouble. After 14 generations, is this the end of the Phillips dynasty at Heath House? We have run out of ideas. We are lumbered with, if you like, a glorified white elephant. Businesswoman Ruth Watson has turned around the fortunes of numerous country houses with her straight-talking, no-nonsense approach. We just have no idea what to do. So if um, Ruth can produce some really workable ideas, well, fine, let's hear them. Today, Ruth is in Staffordshire to meet John and Flavia. Over the next few days, she'll try and come up with a plan to make the estate pay for itself. Bell not working, come in and shout. OK. Hello? Everything about this house is so imposing. This hallway, I mean, is totally magnificent. This was built to really show things off. Oh, hello. Hmm. Hello, you must be Very Flavia. Very nice to meet you. Very good to meet you too. Hello. John. Hello, hello. It's yes, nice to meet you. How do you do? How do you do? Well, you do live in a stonking great pile here, don't you? Yes, it's quite big. <laughs> <laughs> How many bedrooms? Do you know, Ruth, I'm sorry, I don't know. I think that says it all. <laughs> there are miles of corridors, but I honestly don't know. Well, you're in a position now where you think you may have to sell the house. Was that forced by anything particularly? Well, we're not getting any younger. And, John, do you feel sad about it? I feel very, very sad. I am the 14th generation to live on this part of North Staffordshire and the fifth generation to own this house. Mm. So it's a lineage that is not easily forgotten about. Mm. Could we go on the grand tour? Certainly, come this way. <laughs> Built between 1836 and 1840, Heath House was designed to impress on every level. I'll open the doors now, Ruth. As you can see, they were made on a large scale and made extremely well. They're very, very fine carpentry, uh, aren't they? They are, yes. 160 years ago. Fantastic. I can't help but notice that this house has an abundance of furniture. Why so much? I think by Victorian standards, this could be nearly minimalist, but I agree with you, it is quite well furnished. Yeah. Our sons are not married, so nothing has been handed on. Ah, so it hasn't been sequestered um, by not, the next generation. Not quite. Not <laughs> quite. Well, we live in hope. Mm. And yeah. you don't think your two sons could, could carry on? Not realistically, because there is not a salary here. Mm. Before Ruth can draft a plan of action for Heath House, she needs to find out the true state of the family finances. Could we just go through what efforts you've made to um, produce some revenue stream? I do these weddings. Uh, we did none in 2008 because we thought the house was going to be sold. Uh, in the event we had the worst of all worlds, we had no revenue from weddings, um, and nor was the house sold. Mm. But in 2007, I think we did about 11 weddings. It's a bit faulty tired, but we do get there. To make ends meet, the Phillips have also tried to get the 480-acre estate to earn its keep. Could I just ask, how much do you get in from renting out the farmland? About 40,000. But the farmland and the, and the rent, and the, and the let properties, do you And mean? the let properties yes. together? Yes. So about 40,000 pounds. With annual running costs of £70,000 a year and no wedding income, there's a £30,000 shortfall. Did you run your own business successfully? Did it, was it profitable? To be perfectly straightforward, we did run out of money at the mm. end, which was bad news, very mm. bad news, and that was, that was a... So you're kind of used to running out of money. Uh, it has been known, <laughs> yes. One's learnt the hard way that if you're losing money, you've got to do something about it. 
it's very obvious that for decades the Phillips family have been running out of steam. This is why they keep coming back to the notion that this house must be sold. I think it would be a great shame because for John particularly, it does matter to him, his ancestry and the fact that the Phillips have lived here for 14 generations. But Ruth is about to discover that all is not as it seems. Oh dear. And could it all be too late for Heath House? Somebody has put in an offer. So is he seriously considering it? Heath House is the ancestral home of the Phillips family, who have lived on this site in North Staffordshire for 14 generations. But with overheads of £70,000 a year, it's become a burden for current owners John and Flavia Phillips, and they've put the estate up for sale. Their fortunes are very different from that of their ancestors, who, during the Industrial Revolution, built the Gothic mansion on the profits of ribbon manufacturing. John Burton Phillips and his wife, Joanna, demolished their fine Georgian house, and in 1836, work started on the splendid mansion that stands here today. The local stone was cut so precisely that no cement was used in its construction. The family set off on a grand tour of Europe for the four years it took to build the house, returning laden with fine art and furniture for their new home. The impressive staircase dominates the grand hall, but the crowning glory of the house, which Joanna Phillips insisted on, is the 80-foot tower. Today, John and Flavia Phillips rather wish that their ancestors hadn't decided to build such an unmanageable edifice. They've called in businesswoman Ruth Watson to help turn the fortunes of Heath House around. Ruth wants to find out more about the estate's history from Flavia. Family archives reveal evidence of the previous, more modest residence. Those are pictures of the old house. Right. And this is so pretty, isn't it? Much smaller, much more practical by today's standards. So do you think if that had not been pulled down and you'd inherited that with John that you might still want to be I here? I think I could have enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> and these are all Heath House in its heyday. Yes, yes John's <gasps> grandfather on his horse looking pretty sort of statuesque. You can see that... Nobody did anything other than enjoy themselves. They sat about, and I think it was John's grandmother who did a lot of the photography. Recent generations of Phillips have struggled to finance Heath House, and Flavia is reluctant to pass on this burden. You know, with the sons, your sons, is it you really just don't think they've got the metal to do it or the business sense to do it? Well, one doesn't want to see them fall flat on their faces. Nobody's recently married an heiress, which mm. would help, of course. Yes. I mean, if they were very gifted, or if they made a lot of money in the city, or mm. something like that, but they haven't done that so mm. far in life. Mm. So you do have reservations. John and Flavia's eldest son, Ben, has come up from London especially to see Ruth. They meet at the derelict stable block, a site that's ripe for development. Looking at the house from this angle, it's incredibly forbidding. I mean, one could almost say it's grim. <laughs> yes, it's, it's got a kind of ghost-like quality from, from this angle. But did you ever feel in the back of your mind one day, this will all be mine? <laughs> I, I do remember as a five-year-old looking up and going, wow. Your vision for the stable block, what do you think? I desperately want to see this place developed. Yeah. Would one side of that make a great recording mm. studio, for mm. instance? Mm. I think it could be fabulous. Mm. As the eldest son, Ben is eager to inherit the house, but his parents aren't so keen. Why do you think that they don't want to just say, here you are, Ben, it's yours? That is the million dollar question, and I haven't been able to get through to them on that one. So if a sale went ahead mm. without you feeling that you tried your best to do something, yeah. it would make... I would feel cheated. I'd, I'd feel gutted, actually. What there's never been, Ruth, has been a, a long-term strategic plan, plan, and we've, we've gone... <laughs> I'm very pleased to hear those words <laughs> emanating from your mouth because that's entirely what this property needs yeah. and what this property yeah. doesn't appear to have had for about a hundred years. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, I mean, that's With no long-term plan, there's little hope that Ben will become the sixth generation to reside at Heath House in its present form. Could this be the end of the line for the Phillips family? Right. Mm. Well, this is it. 
the big family map, which goes all the way back up I to... I love the way it says the Phillips pedigree, like you're all dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm down at the bottom here, and so is my brother. That's all blank from here on in. Yeah. So, if this was the end, yeah. Benjamin and Justin, how would that make you feel? Um, I think it would... It would be sad. It would be sad, yes. Um, but it is remarkable that there always seems to have been a male heir to take it on down. So there's another burden, progeny as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's all down to you, Ben. Yeah. Big shoulders, <laughs> yes. <laughs> to provide an overview of the situation, John takes Ruth up the tower. Like his ancestors, he's extremely proud of it. Right, come along, Ruth. This, this is the way. Right, nearly there. Yeah, a bit more yet. Uh, but you can think that you're getting nearer to heaven with each step. <laughs> that's definitely hey, man, some don't... solace. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that's a way up. When you come up here and you survey your property, I mean, doesn't that kind of give you the spur to carry on with this rather than sell it? I think I have inherited, like my ancestors, an air of, of, of liking to show off. And certainly, bringing up one's guests up here, and I say I, I own all that you can see, bow down and worship me, um, and they do, and they think it's wonderful. Um, but I think they leave, go down the tower saying to themselves, thank God it, uh, it's not my responsibility. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and that's the truth of all these houses, and that's the whole point, mm. is that, unfortunately, it's always in the hands of one family to maintain something that's actually for the national good. Anyway, this area is um, very exalted for the likes of me, so I'm going to go down. <laughs> False humility, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Back on firm ground, Ruth takes the opportunity to explore the rest of the estate. The formal parterre and original Georgian orangery are in good repair and could provide a perfect backdrop for weddings. But the abandoned servants' quarters at the rear of the house have been neglected for decades. I'm in just one room of what feels like hundreds in the derelict servants' wing. We're down to bare brick on the walls. Windows are out. I mean, this is really dangerous stuff because, you know, this is where the rot starts. And the Phillips, you know, might be living in splendour in the drawing room, but up here, it's another story. In a bid to find solutions to the Phillips' financial problems, Ruth is on her way to Hardwick Hall, 45 miles away. It was built for Elizabeth Hardwick, once one of the wealthiest women in England. Today, it's owned by the National Trust. Assistant property manager Richard Heap shows Ruth around. This is famous for Bess of Hardwick, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Bess, Elizabeth, Countess of Shrewsbury, uh, built it in the late, uh, late 1500s. And just as a sheer display of her wealth and prominence. Oh, absolutely. She has her initials all on the turret, so yeah. she really made sure that everyone knew, knew she, she had yeah. the money, yes. But today, Ruth is more interested in a more modest residence. Now you've got this stable block, and what prompted the National Trust to uh, refurbish it and turn it into holiday lets? Uh, the stable block needed renovation and it was decided at the time that holiday cottages would be a, a good avenue to go down. Oh, this is really attractive, isn't this it? This is um, high hazels, yes. Very nicely done. How many rooms in here? Uh, sleeps 12, actually. Oh, my gosh. Like Heath House, Hardwick Hall is in prime tourist territory. Close to the Potteries, Peak District and birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, this part of the country attracts millions of visitors every year. It's a market the Phillips could be tapping into. Here we are in one of the double rooms on the first floor of the house. This is obviously quite a large unit. What would you say was the optimum size for a number of um, people? Around about six to eight, I think, is yeah. probably optimum. And, and in high season, what kind of rental could you expect? Um, for a sleep six, high season, around about £1,400. Fantastic. And, of course, one of the other marvellous things is that you can actually see the big house. I yes. mean, how much do you think that adds to the reason why people come? I, th I think that's a great attraction.
Having done her research, Ruth has come up with a portfolio of ideas that could generate a healthy income for Heath House. Hello. But with the property still on the market, Ruth must persuade the Phillips that keeping the estate in the family is a viable option. The first thing I would say to you, which I think you should take comfort in, is that because the house hasn't sold and you've had it on the market for two years or thereabouts, that actually gives you a great window of opportunity. Are you therefore saying that the house should be taken off the market? I am saying that it's entirely down to you. I know you have doubts about Ben inheriting, but you also feel very strongly that, you know, you are part of the Phillips line, your sons are as well, and that this house matters to you. But actually, you're the stumbling block. The estate costs £70,000 a year to run, but Ruth is convinced that the Phillips can achieve this by getting Heath House back in business. My solution to the problems are, first and foremost, that you take in hand the weddings in a way that you haven't done at the moment and really try and get some proper profit out of them. I think it could provide jolly good cash flow. I think this is something Ben could easily do while he still holds down his position in the city. That could produce an income of 50, 60, 70, 80,000 a year if it's done properly. After her visit to Hardwick Hall, Ruth has also come up with a financial solution that could secure the future of Heath House for generations to come. When it comes to a longer term, bigger project, I think that the stable buildings would make fantastic holiday lets. I think you could be looking at 100,000 a year cash flow there as well. Do you think the holiday lets would do in this area? Would do well? There are enough people around about you that are doing it with large houses and have got successful holiday lets for me to think so, yes. I mean, this has been gone into in some considerable depth already. And my estate agents, if you like, have poured buckets of cold water on the whole concept. Wow. Saying, because it's going to cost too, a, a hell of a lot and you're not going to derive um, sufficient income to cover it, to cover well, the expenses. Looking... Can I just finish, yes, please? Sir. The cost of turning those tables into, let's for argument's sake, say office um, accommodation for the moment, it has generally been said that it would not cover the costs, that it would be... But I'm not suggesting office accommodation. No, I, mean, I know you're not. It's a stupid but, idea, um, because where are you going to get people to come and, you know, uh, carry out business here? I mean, that's uh, madness. OK, fine. Uh, the other idea that has been floated was to have tree houses up in the back of the woods, which couldn't be done. But this but... is all kind of nebulous, silly little bits and pieces. Yes. I, I think if the bank were to see a proper plan for this house, I think you would get some fundings from the bank, enough to do the stables. And with a captive audience on site, Ruth thinks the Phillips could make more of their historic links with the Industrial Revolution. It did occur to me that if you can join with other houses, Wedgwood and all the various places around, which are only there because of the industry that created them, I could see a tour of what made Britain great. I mean, Americans would love it because they got history lessons. I think the amalgam of all those things could provide a very, very decent cash flow. But before considering any of Ruth's solutions, the Phillips need to resolve a crucial dilemma. Make a go of Heath House or sell up. Normally, I ask people to do a certain amount of work before my next visit. Um, in your case, I think the biggest thing has got to be a decision. And I think you have actually, perhaps with Justin as well, you actually have just got to sit round a table, lock yourselves in and work out what you're going to do. Yes, quite fine. Yes, I mean, <laughs> there's, there's no well, argument. I'm sorry it's everything. not music to your ears, John. <laughs> well, but, you know, it's... well, I've battled all my life. And after a while, you, you get... You lose you want, steam. Well, you just, just, for God's sake, let's have a bit of peace. If I give you no other piece of advice, it's that you've got to stop sitting on the pot and actually start pissing. <laughs> what a graphic description. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> It was good. Um, it is like having a good internal flush out and, and you feel better for it. I think it could be tremendously exciting and, and very liberating and might be the making of me. It is an opportunity to, have, to let Benjamin uh, start to fly. I could be the hero that Heath House needs.
providing that we don't get a really good offer. Four weeks later, Ben calls Ruth with a worrying development. Hello, Ruth. Hi, how are you? I had a phone call from my dad Tuesday night. Somebody has put in an offer right. on the property for two. Two million? Yes, which is 40% below the asking price. So is he seriously considering it? He's got mum yelling in his ear, it's an offer, it's an offer. Ruth wants Ben to tackle this head on and suggests he calls a family meeting. I mean, the major, major thing is, Ben, if I say nothing else, is don't let John bully you. No. You know, I'm going into this for guns and blazing tomorrow. I really think you should be trying to resist it. Good luck, yeah. Ben. Good luck. All right. The next day, Ben and his brother Justin head to their parents' home in Worcestershire to decide whether to give Ruth's plan a go or sell Heath House at a vastly reduced price. I mean, Dad, this, this particular offer that's on the table at the moment, where are we with it? I don't think as yet we know enough to know whether yeah. to give any positive answer. I don't think we can yeah. say I'm procrastinating, but um, that is nonetheless the fact. To be honest, I think that this whole business of keeping on the market just distracts us from what we're trying to do, which is to create a business. One feels we, we owe more to the place than, than just selling it for a song. We've, we've got to cross the threshold and do, do these events because we get frankly, derisory offers in from time to time, and they are not, when they're scrutinised, they're, they're not worth the paper they're written on. Then you've got to do Plan B. Yeah. But then if you're going into Plan B, then you've got to stick at it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I suspect sort of... we'd achieve more in two years by doing this than we would by twiddling our thumbs it's, uh, away from this, I mean, this whole thing is going to take um, a long time. The days of talking, we've had seven years of it, and it's got to stop. <laughs> With an offer still on the table, the family remains divided. Justin and Ben are keen to keep Heath House and make it commercial, but aware of the family's past financial struggles, John and Flavia feel it more prudent to sell. I suspect a little bit of Lady Macbeth dripping poison into Dad's ear and, and saying, you know, it's all going to go belly up. Well, it has to act in concert with one's wife, as I'm sure you know. I don't truthfully think that selling it would, would make him happy. Deep down. With the future of Heath House hanging in the balance, it's up to Ben to prove his worth. But is he fully equipped for the challenges that lie ahead? This table's laid. Whoa! Oh, no, 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 no! Who's opening the champagne? Whoa! Have you ever held a party before? This is the sort of thing that happens, I suppose. Heath House in North Staffordshire has been owned by the Phillips family for five generations. But this historic lineage could soon be over. Current owners John and Flavia Phillips have been considering an offer on the estate. But after weeks of protracted negotiations, it falls through. It's been almost three months since Ruth Watson's last visit. She's convinced the family don't need to sell the estate and can make it commercial. Ruth thinks it's time to give son and heir Ben the opportunity to prove himself. Hello, Flavia. How are you? Very Good nice to see, to see you. you. Good to mm. see you. The joy, John, is the Phillips are here to greet me, not some Hello. unknown purchaser. <laughs> With a reprieve on the house, Ruth wants the Phillips to consider short-term solutions to their financial problems and has called in entrepreneurs Mark chichester Clark and Charlie Hurt. Very attractive. They run Stately Home Vacations, a brand new concept aimed at the high end tourist market. It's, it's lovely. It's absolutely great. Yeah. What I thought we'd do actually, properly later on this evening, is if the weather holds, then we'll have drinks out here on the terrace if that's all right. Stately Home Vacations have persuaded some of England's finest country houses to open their doors to paying guests, each property hand picked by Mark and Charlie. Um, and obviously, the big attraction is the view. Lovely um, views. Just during the summer as well. Just so. the sort of thing we're, we're after, actually, isn't yeah, it? Just um, and, and your bathroom is all sweet through there. Oh, it's the a lucrative business. Parties of ten will pay up to £1,500 for bed, breakfast and dinner with the gentry. Tonight, Ben is to host an overnight stay and a dinner party for 12. 
You're going to be comfortable. I will be very You're comfortable. You'll be all right here. Yeah. Yeah, OK, <laughs> great. It's up to him to prove that he and Heath House are worthy of a place on the stately home vacations books. Ruth is keen for Ben to prove that he can run Heath House successfully. But she suspects that John still has concerns. He's impractical, and you do need practicality with Heath House. Yeah. On the other hand, he's much more cerebral than I am. And countless people have said that I've sort of bullied Benjamin. You would prefer it if he did stand up to you and yes, did... Yes, of course. My mother always used to say that I sort of bullied Benjamin or something. I, don't, I haven't con consciously done so. Well, it's been the last thing I wanted to do. My only concern is for Benjamin himself. But he has always sort of felt that Heath House would be where he could he could really blossom. You seem to now be willing to have Ben give this a go. I don't think he could live with himself if he didn't give it a go. Mm. I think that is what it amounts to. I think it's really good that you have come round to this. It allows both of you to move on because Benjamin can never hold it against you that you didn't give him a go. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's your brick. I like you a lot. <laughs> With the go-ahead from John, all eyes are on Ben. And with tonight's guests due to arrive in a few hours' time, the pressure is on. On hand to help out is stately home vacation's Dawn Rudd. Oh, wonderful. That's great. It's coming on, isn't OK. It? Well, I'm, I'm going to light the fire now. OK. So. Hi, Ben. How's it all going? Hi. Hello, Mark. Yeah, no, we're, we're doing well. Um, Looks good. We must think about um, the... Plus more, where, where, where we're all going to sit. Yeah. Just hope we don't burn down the house before dinner. Yeah. <laughs> the chef is busy in the kitchen as Ben makes the last minute touches in the dining room. Right. Teach you a little trick of napkin folds. Okay, oh, you're not napkin folds. <laughs> <laughs> I will go and. Do you want to go and wash your hands? I will go and wash and my hands. I shall start. Most of the guests have arrived and it's time for drinks on the terrace. But nothing seems to be happening. Ruth is worried. I'm slightly concerned because um, all the guests should have arrived, right. and I don't think they all have. Yeah. Um, all the other things, tables laid. Yeah. And wine. Who's opening the champagne? Right. Um, uh, have you ever held a party before? Forgive me, because I thought I, I thought Dawn was coordinating it, and there's been a lack of communication as to who's doing what. Right. Do you think you ought to be asking Dawn who is doing what? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. We need to fill those gaps. OK, all right. All right. You go talk okay, with right. Dawn. I think the first things we need to do, first of all, um, get, get a drink um, yes, and absolutely. running. And obviously find out where the guests are. Yeah. Oh, Give right. them so, another yes, 20 minutes. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you sort out drinks. And right. The champagne is in the fridge? Champagne's in the fridge. Right. There's um, orange juice on the side. OK. Well, we, we can put the sort of few things in motion and hopefully they might turn up. Right. Okay. Should we go up through here? Absolutely. Ben eventually gets the champagne flowing. I am. Let me top that glass, because the tide seems to have gone out. But two guests are still missing, and dinner is due to be served in half an hour. So are we still missing people? We're still missing two guests. We've got the yeah. champagne lined up and the flutes and everything else. Right, yeah. I think you need to talk to the cook. Right. Find yeah. out how they're doing, because right. there needs to be a point where you actually say these people aren't going to arrive. Right, OK. I'm going a decision to talk, has I'm going to, to be talk made. To ben, now. this is a small decision, right. okay. but it's one you need to make. Right, OK. <laughs> Eventually, the missing guests arrive. Hi. Just in time um, for dinner. And Caroline, is it? Yes. Hello, hi, yes. Ben Hello. Phillips. Very Hello. nice to meet Hello. you. Hello. 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 This is Dawn. Hello. Yeah, do come on in. Hi. Come on in. I hope you all heard that. Yes. Dinner is now served. As the guests savour the atmosphere, they get a chance to find out more about the family. And as everybody says, if you're a single man living with your aunt... It's a jolly good thing to do. <laughs> and its ancestry. So my, my great-grand... Great my grandfather him and my great-great is him. Not very nice. 
person, I'm, I'm told. Right. Hey, George, he boards with my sister, oh. has done for the last 20 years. How sensible. So what so, was the surname? OK. So okay. I think I think that was the connection. I, I don't know. The whole thing feels lived in, and it isn't yes. just a, a sort of big house. It's, it's a real home. And, I quite agree. And um, lovely gardens. And the caption is, this is why Mummy won't let me be king. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> Obviously, this has been an experiment, and it's um, shown up the fact that Ben is a little unskilled at hostly duties, but he is very sweet, and I think it really shows that Heath House is so well suited to this kind of event. People sitting around the table in the dining room, eating and drinking, and being interested in the history of the house, interested in the history of the Phillips family. I think, judiciously planned, this could work. Ben has risen to the challenge, but what do the guests think about their stately evening? The hosts were utterly charming, having never met them before, and that, after all, is what makes an evening. It's got the most lovely family atmosphere. It's all slightly sort of old-fashioned, and it's wonderful. It's a place lots of people are going to want to come to. The next morning and the guests tuck into breakfast. If the Phillips hosted just two of these events a month, they could increase their annual turnover by £36,000. But has Ben done enough to impress the experts, Mark and Charlie? I think Heath House is fantastic. I'm really impressed. I thought the family were fantastic hosts. They made an effort to get to know everybody and that's incredibly important. I think Americans would love it. We would certainly want to use it. Heath House and Ben have made the grade, and it's prompted John to make a significant decision that could see Ben permanently take on the estate. The house is coming off the market, so Benjamin does have a clear run. One must be positive that things do work out, and who knows what even Miss Wright might turn up. Benjamin <laughs> can't really get out of now being in the hot seat. With the estate firmly off the market, Ben is determined to prove to his parents that he's up for the challenge. He aims to employ a company to run events, but today he's hosting his first wedding reception, the first at Heath House for 18 months. The pressure's on. Ruth estimates that weddings alone could rake in around £80,000 a year, enough to run the whole estate. To help out, Ben's drafted in Aunt Anthea, his London landlady. Whoa! Whoa! Hang on to the wall. Oh, yeah, thanks. Oh. Ben must ensure that the day runs like clockwork, but already there are problems with the lighting system. I don't know why this one doesn't work it now. No. You said it... Did it work previously? Yeah, when I came, first came out of the front door, it was on when I plugged it in. Now it's died. <laughs> All right, so you what is might it? have to reference your father. It's not a, something to be undertaken too lightly, is it? Having your own marquee. You, can... you need a screwdriver? Yes. Yeah. I think it's good to, to thrust him into the deep end, and only by mistakes will he learn. I don't mean that too pompously, but that's fact, isn't it? Right, I will go and um, I'll go and get a new bulb. This is the sort of thing that happens, I suppose. With the lighting sorted, the stage is set, and Ben is front of house. Hello, I'm Ben. Hello, how do you do? Right? Hello, I'm, I'm the next generation down, so... I think I've met uh... you before a bit, but... Oh, I think we may have done, actually, yes. In the garden. Oh, wonderful. Oh, how... Your wife looks fantastic. Very nice to meet you. I'm Benjamin. I'm... Yeah. You're in charge the, of the, the family, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, so it's lovely to have everybody yeah. Bride and groom Haley and Matt live locally and were thrilled to discover that Heath House was back on the market as a wedding venue. Over the moon with the venue, I say, when Matt proposed to me, I wanted it up here, but they weren't doing weddings at the time, so it was an off chance that I asked if they were doing them and it just so happened you were starting doing weddings again. So I, we jumped at the chance, didn't we? And yeah. Something special, isn't it? Yeah. Ben might be running proceedings, 
but John has plenty of wisdom to hand down to his son. Now, you could uh, produce the odd cushion, just that, those sorts of little things, but um, I know they're bloody uncomfortable, those chairs. Now go for it, then. What, meet and greet? Yeah. yeah. So I'm Ben, I'm, I'm the son of... John? Yeah, that's yeah. right, you know, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Him, they're kind of handing over the, um, the meet and greets to me now. Oh, well. Must just kiss the bride, hello. How are well you? Done. Very well. Those benches are chronically uncomfortable. Would you like a couple of cushions? Because I'm going to and get a couple. Would that be... No, no, we'll be are you right? fine. What about you? Um, are you all right on that? Yeah. OK, OK. Um, was it your mum? Mrs. Mrs. Phillips. Yes, yes, yes. I remember her. Well, I thought she... she was a lovely lady. Yes, yeah. <laughs> she, she, she had a strong character. Nothing um, wrong with that. No. In the fullness of time, you've got to find your own style, and it's it's easier to do that if 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 you have not the monkey on your back. So sometimes one has to um, just. Do, bite your tongue. Bite your tongue. Just you a little. Do. Yeah. The yes, yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you get soaked? I think last time it was this this end that came off. When a problem with the water supply threatens to disable the portaloos, Ben's on the case. A proud Aunt Anthea looks on. Well, it seems that Dave Benjamin's doing quite a good job. It's an opportunity for him, and he just needs to um, make a success of something to prove to his parents that he can. The old, the old man's so tight, you won't buy any more. <laughs> With the wedding reception in full swing, Ben can at last relax and reflect on his success. I've really enjoyed it. I was a little bit apprehensive at the beginning. Well, I think, like all of these things, it's down to practice. And uh, if we can get a really smooth machine up and running, um, there's, there's no reason why we can't lay on a very good show every time. But despite his promise to take the house off the market, John appears to be going back on his word. I was accused of procrastinating by Ruth, and to that extent, I will perhaps go on procrastinating and keep our options open, given a really good offer then um, one, would, one would be mad not to consider it. With Ben's trial period over, time is running out for Heath House. Can Ruth persuade John Phillips that it's time to finally hand over the reins to his eldest son? What is the harm in giving it a try? And has Ben done enough to prove that he is up to the job? Because they don't think I can wipe my bottom. Ben Phillips is determined to persuade his parents not to sell their ancestral home and give him the chance to run it as a commercial concern. With the help of Ruth Watson, he's proved he's got what it takes. But Ben's parents are yet to be convinced and are considering a new offer on the estate. In a bid to unite the family, Ruth returns to Heath House for the final time. I'm not actually expecting to see many material changes at Heath House. It's more about whether Ben has been able to develop the steely resolve necessary to resist his father's plans for this house, namely to sell it. In her first visit seven months ago, Ruth suggested the Phillips celebrate their heritage. Ben has started work on collating the wealth of information. So this is not the same room we were in when I saw the collection with Flavia, is it? It's not. This was a bedroom. and This seemed to be a good idea to convert it into an archive right. bedroom for the time being. I have to be very honest, Ben. This is pretty much what I saw the first time. It, it needs to have some more meaning than yeah. this. Do you know what I mean? Conta, absolutely, I mm. do. And I think if we can pull all of this together, um, I think it would, it would really help to give the place you know, a narrative and, and a uniqueness yes. um, that the people would take away with. And how are we doing on this business of offers for the house? Dad told me that um, there is one other person and that if that doesn't materialise, then that we take it off the market and we concentrate on this. Can you trust him on that? I, I lost my temper with him, because we can go on like this forever. Well, I think 
the only way that your parents are going to believe in you is for you to actually do something mm. physical, you know, mm. to say, right, I'm, I'm here, I'm coming here. My plan is, is to move up here in the spring of next year. Well, I think you need to declare that. It, mm. it is a nightmare parents and children and you need an intermediary mm. because they don't think I can wipe my bottom. Impressed with Ben's newfound confidence, Ruth calls the family, including brother Justin, to a meeting to resolve the matter once and for all. The problem really is that John, to date, Ben is not really getting the support from you because you keep looking at offers for the house. So. In effect, this actually isn't a problem about how to raise money, because I think that's really quite easy. I don't entirely agree with you. To date, we have only got two bookings for next year. That is all we've got. But the reason for that is because there's always this caveat about is the house actually going to be in your ownership? And while that situation pertains, it's never going to go full thrust. Yes. But I think that if a really good offer did come along, then um, one should consider it. But I don't think you can have it both ways. I find it quite baffling that you wouldn't give Ben that opportunity, even if you think he's going to fail, because the jeopardy is so small in comparison with the opportunity. I mean, in the future, Justin, I mean, would you want to come and live here? It would be fantastic to see the place, you know, operating as, as a successful business, of course it would be. In, in terms of the immediate plans, I mean, Benjamin is centre stage here. If we're going to put all our eggs into Benjamin's basket, we do want to feel comfortable that Benjamin has got the necessary training and ability to handle it. Because you don't trust that he can do it. No, My point that is, hasn't been said. Well, I think it's very evident, because otherwise you'd just be saying, get on with it. We need clarity and focus here, um, away from the distractions of, of possible interested buyers because that just mm. that just makes me feel crap to mm. be honest because mm. I think well am I you know am I am I investing in here or am I not you know nobody is answering the question that I really want to know what is the harm in giving it a try there is no harm so no fine um let's let Benjamin have a clear run at it and I think, you know, Ben, you have got to show the gumption to do this. Yeah. Could we have agreement that as long as Ben is living here, he gets till the end of 2011 yeah. to prove what he can do? Fine, OK. Going to hold you to it, John. With agreement at last within the Phillips family, Ruth leaves them with one final thought. The only last thing that Ben's got to do, of course, is procreate somehow. Well... <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite glad I haven't got that burden as well as this <laughs> at, at the moment, the do you moment. know what I mean? <laughs> I think it shows that massive progress has been made in as much as the Phillips family have now agreed that Ben can have his opportunity of living here, of making a business here and of trying to make it work. I think he's going to have to show an enormous amount of stamina and robustness to stand up to his father, but at least he's got his chance. <laughs>